Capitol Hill, coverage of a House hearing looking into whether an independent counsel should be named to investigate campaign fundraising. You see on your uh, screen Representative Dan Burton of Indiana, who is chairing the meeting. Included in the record, and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record, and without objection. Reserving the right to object. What, what is that request? It's. All ex articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record. We have no objection. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to an equal number of majority and minority members for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, divided equally between the majority and the minority. Without objection, so ordered. I move that questioning in the matter under consideration... Oh, pardon me. Okay. I ask unanimous consent that the depositions of Truman Arnold, Brian Bailey, Mark Bartholomew, Jackie Belante, Chuck Benjamin, Joseph Birkenstock, Erskine Bowles, Ann Brazell, Jerry Carlson, Brian Danes, Jim Dorskind, Donald Dunn, Nancy Friedman, Karen Hancock, Carl Hessner, Paul Hurst, Harold Ickes, Phil Ladner, Ladder, or Later, Evelyn Lieberman, Renell Lopez, Percy Malone, Alice Pushkar, Frank Reeder, Marcia Scott, Ann Stock, Brooke Stroud, Richard Sullivan, Ari Swiller, Laura Taman, Patsy Thomason, Jody Torkelson, Don Upson, Eric Vaden, Kimberly Witness, Wittis, James Wright, Johnny Ma, Glenville Stewart, Robert Prinz, Matt Fong, Volumes 1 and 2, Daniel Wong, Joseph Sandler, Stephen Walker, Gary Locke, Hyun Haobang, Hadi Kernanawan, Lily Wong, and Kerry Ching be made publicly available, and without objection, so ordered. Reserving the right to object. Jan, uh, the gentleman will state his reservation. You have read a lengthy list, Chairman, of uh, the names of individuals whose statements you wish to be made public. Is that correct? That's correct. Would you kindly read? the list of depositions that you do not wish to have made public. Well, I, I don't think that's uh, necessary at the present time. I believe it is very necessary because some of us believe that all of the depositions should be made public. And I personally object to the selective release of depositions. We feel that this is an inquiry which should be as open as possible. You read a list of uh, two dozen or so names. I have no objections to any of those depositions be made public. Since you are the one who selected these names for public disclosure, it is a legitimate inquiry on my part as to why you have chosen not to make the rest of the names public. It's my understanding uh, uh, that uh, we have consulted with the minority and they have asked that some of these uh, depositions be included. We've tried to accommodate the minority. So this is a, an agreed upon list of uh, depositions to be released and uh, I, don't, I didn't know of any objections from, uh, from the minority on this because we have tried to accommodate them. Gentlemen, you. I'll be happy to you. These uh, depositions, as I understand it, relate to the issue of the White House database. Is that... Uh Right. Well, as I understand it, some are related to Ted Siong. Ted Siong. Right. We were uh, uh, consulted about the release of those depositions, we and, the, and our minority staff, and uh, we, we have no objection to these depositions. We will ask that later that other depositions be made public as well, but we have no objection to these being public. Yes, I have I have no objection to these being made public, and I will be pleased to 
have a discussion later on about other depositions being made public, and I withdraw my objection. I thank the gentleman. So without objection, so ordered. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen. Would it be uh, appropriate this time to make a unanimous consent request that we uh, make available the depositions that were taken of Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, and Larry Wong? As the chair is aware, we spent considerable time in this committee <coughs> discussing uh, taking the depositions and the public testimony of four witnesses, which this committee deadlocked over for several weeks because we were engaged in a dispute over the rules under which this committee operates. And there was a lot said at the time regarding um, the importance of those uh, four witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, I know Mr. Boehner on the floor of the House said that <laughs> those four witnesses had direct knowledge about how the Chinese government made illegal campaign contributions in an apparent attempt to influence our foreign policy. And I know Representative uh, Shattig said that each of those witnesses has substantial, significant information which was relevant to the committee's investigation. So the public had the impression that those four witnesses had something important to say uh, to this committee. And I know that the depositions of those witnesses have been taken and that um, with the exception of one of them, which the Justice Department has uh, voiced an objection to releasing, that there is no objection to releasing the depositions of the other three. Uh, I personally would have thought that after we went through the uh, debate in this committee regarding the rules and reached an accord, and that since the issue uh, involved those four witnesses' testimonies, that we would have at least brought those four witnesses before the committee so that the American people could know what those four witnesses had to say that this committee seemed to be engaged in a deadlock over for several weeks. So I'd like to see them come and testify before the committee, but at a minimum, it seems that we should add the three witnesses uh, to the list that the chair has um, laid out and that we've agreed to release so that the public can have the opportunity to know whether or not these witnesses had thing to add to our investigation of alleged illegal um, <coughs> campaign activities uh, in the elections. We uh, just concluded uh, depositions on uh, two of those people this past week. Those depositions are being reviewed right now. As you stated, uh, Kent Law's deposition, uh, the Justice Department has requested that we not release that until they have further reviewed it. We anticipate having hearings in early September on the uh, including the people you're talking about and we will be releasing those depositions at the proper time but until we're prepared for the hearings uh, we don't think they should be released because we're reviewing all the things that they said in their depositions but we are, it's our intention to release those later gentlemen uh, well, yield to me on this yield, reservation uh, I can respect the fact that we wouldn't want to have something that may jeopardize our investigation <laughs> but our hearing today is to go into questions on a memo by Mr. Lella to the Attorney General and the Attorney General has made it clear that she doesn't want her investigation jeopardized and her investigation leads to criminal prosecutions uh, and we wouldn't want uh, the ability to bring uh, criminal actions against those who have committed wrongdoing to be in any way hindered. So I just point out this inconsistency. but. Uh, but as I understand the depositions we've already taken of uh, these witnesses for whom there was such a great to-do about uh, giving them immunity because they would fill in all the gaps showing uh, what was going on in the conspiracy, uh, I, would, I think those, those depositions that have been taken uh, from my understanding, and I'm not going to reveal anything that was in the depositions, but they do not support any of the claims that were made uh, for those witnesses being deposed and I think the public ought to have that information out there I think we ought to know now uh, what they had to say and and, uh, and and have it on the on the public record just as we're now releasing the depositions of people and uh, the others who had knowledge about Ted Siong or or the White House database um, I don't know if the chairman hearings on those issues 
but we spent a lot of time deposing a lot of people in secret behind closed doors the public ought to have available to them what was said especially since I contend that what we had was an enormous fishing expedition where people's rights were trampled on as they were forced to come in be deposed hour after hour uh, with enormous expense to them uh, as a result of those uh, intrusions on their uh, on their uh, privacy and time Reserving I right support your request Mr. Chairman Reserving let, let right me just uh, Mr. Chairman let me just state it real simply Mr. Chairman I, I when we in this committee on this side of the aisle took the opportunity when the chair wanted to immunize these witnesses to use that as our opportunity to try to exact from the chair some fair rules for the operation of this committee which the chair eventually agreed to and we appreciated your willingness to work with us and arrive at a fair set of rules to proceed under during that period of time your side of the aisle was accusing, accusing the Democrats of trying to hide something by refusing to immunize these four witnesses. And we were not hiding anything, and we think it's very, very important for the chair to acknowledge that now that we have reached an agreement, the witnesses have been immunized, their testimony has been taken, that those who accused us of hiding something need to come forth and let the public know what these witnesses had to say because we were not hiding anything and we'd I like to have you join with us and I, I, allow I, I these witnesses to be heard. I think the gentleman has made his point very clear twice now and the chair will state one more time it is our intention to release those depositions after they've been thoroughly reviewed we plan to have hearings in September right after the break and those depositions will be released at that time. <laughs> premature to release those right now because we're not yet prepared for the hearings and we're reviewing those depositions which were just taken last week. These other depositions were taken some time ago and have been thoroughly reviewed. Mr. The Chairman, gentleman, Mr. Chairman, gentleman, Mr. Chairman, the gentleman from uh, Indiana, Mr. Souter. I'm disappointed that this is the way this uh, process has started this morning. I think history is not going to look kindly on those who have tried to obstruct these hearings and have tried in one way or another to slow us down rather than cooperating and moving this ahead. The chairman gave a specific proposal that he would go ahead with the hearing with this, that we're going to release the proposed depositions. If the attorney general had made a similar commitment that within the next few weeks uh, or even by early September that, the, that her document would be released, that certain progress would be made, we wouldn't be here today. Gentlemen, you. And in, and in parity, it is a, a double standard and, in my opinion, is just a move this morning to try to once again slow down a process that we have had 112 people flee this country or plead the fifth. People wonder why we haven't had more success. It's because people come up here and say constantly and tell us that, that they aren't going to participate. Then when we finally pushed it on the floor, they weren't major players, they were minor players in pieces that you have to put together to make a major case. And at least we have some people willing and, and able finally to take some of these depositions. Then we're going to go ahead, but it takes a while to move that process. What we haven't seen from the administration is that same commitment. I yield to the gentleman. I thank you for yielding. I think you misunderstand the realities of the situation. First of all, we want the facts to get out there. We're not trying to hide anything. Those of you who are refusing to make the deposition public seems to me have to bear the burden of appearing to keep the public from knowing what was said, especially by people to whom it was claimed that if we uh, only would give them immunity, they would give us the whole uh, uh, blueprint of what was going on. Now we've taken their depositions. We ought to make that public because I'll, I would contend that uh, their depositions would lead no reasonable person to reach that conclusion. Second point I want to make to you is the Attorney General has made a commitment that in the course of three weeks she will decide the issue of independent counsel and she will then uh, be willing to, to uh, meet with the chairman of this committee, and Mr. Hyde and Mr. Hatch, who are the chairman of the committees with jurisdiction in the House and the Senate Judiciary, to talk about her decision and to brief them on the memo. Uh, as, a, as the chairman refused to give her just three weeks She's had and is uh, now uh, suggesting oh, that she be held in contempt. The gentleman yield back to balance so, this time. Uh, I want to the gentleman has yielded to me if he continues to yield to me, he'll hear some facts you might want. I would, I would like to reclaim my time 
uh, and the, the major uh, point that I want to make here is the chairman has said multiple times we are going to release these. One was not, the Justice Department chooses not to release, or would rather have us not release, so we just completed. We're now pro going through a process of what should be bipartisan hearings and looking into the problem of violations of the law. And I object to the unanimous consent. Objection is heard. Mr. Chairman, uh, since uh, the objection has been made to unanimous consent, I'd like to be recognized for a motion. Uh, you can make your motion. Mr. Chairman, a, point, uh, a parliamentary inquiry before you uh, reach that. Uh, was the uh, unanimous consent request that the chair made regarding the releasing of the depositions that were cited by the chair, was that approved without objection? Mm -hmm. Thank you. The gentleman will state his motion. Mr. Chairman, respecting the fact that the chair would like a little time before releasing the three depositions, uh, I would uh, make the following motion. I, I move that under House Rule 11, Clause 2, K7, of com and Committee Document Protocol Clause 2.C, that the committee release the depositions of Irene Wu, Nancy Lee, and Larry Wong on or before August 14th of 1998 and to have these depositions included in the committee record. I've heard the motion. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California. I seek to be recognized uh, in support of this motion. I want to... Uh, the gentleman is recognized. ...that uh, to the gentleman from Indiana, those who have accused the Democrats of trying to slow things down, we have never once objected to any request by the chairman to make any information public. We even agreed to the unanimous consent request made a minute ago to make public uh, depositions of people uh, taken by our committee in regard to the White House database and inquiries about Ted Siong. But let me also point out the Republicans on this committee have never once agreed to a request that we've made to make information public. Now, I want to ask who is trying to, to slow things down? Who is trying to keep the public from knowing the facts? I think the Republicans are going to be embarrassed that after hyping and grandstanding uh, the significance of those uh, four witnesses to whom we granted immunity, that uh, they, for all practical purposes, had nothing to add to this inquiry. They did not live up to the uh, to the hype that they were going to fill in all the blanks, give us the road map, tell us the, 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 the connections uh, to the Democratic administration and the, and the conspiracy with the Chinese government. These witnesses did not live up to that billing, and uh, we ought to make their depositions public now so that uh, there'd be no doubt about it. The chairman has said he wants to make it public later. Well, I see no reason to make it public later. Let's make it public now. The public has a right to know. Let's not slow down the public's uh, uh, information flow about this very important issue. I support the gentleman's motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the previous question. Second, please. I'll withhold, withhold the motion. Chairman, uh, Mr. Just, Chairman. just one second, please. Rather than withholding the icon while we're waiting, may I make it just a brief comment? You want to be recognized? Yes, I'd like well, to be Real recognized. briefly while we confer. I wanted to have a brief response to one point that Mr. Wackman made. Um, re I am not going to say or maintain that there weren't individual members on the floor who were not in this committee 
who may have overstated what the specific things that these four witnesses were going to offer, three witnesses. But I believe the members in this committee knew roughly what they were proffering and that I think it is unfair to characterize the Republican position on this committee as saying that these witnesses were going to make points that were major points as opposed to pieces in a larger puzzle. Therefore, the word significant or, uh, and, and words that were used by some of our members were not for the end case, but were for pieces of a puzzle of which any piece missing in a puzzle is significant. And that I believe that when the day is done, and if these depositions, and when these depositions are released, and when the hearings are, and when we see the next hearings after that, just reading these testimonies now, or depositions now, will not necessarily shed much light. But as the thing <laughs> progresses, and as we, if we can see the, the memo that was sent to the Attorney General, then as we see other pieces of the puzzle that are come forth anywhere from three maybe 12 months when people start to talk, we'll see the importance of these depositions. It is way premature to, to state that they are, in, are, are not valuable or their value based on where we are currently. They wouldn't have taken the fifth, and we wouldn't have gone into this, if there wasn't something most likely that they feared would incriminate them. Gentlemen, yield. Uh, it's, it, uh, the gentleman's yeah, time. Would the, gentleman, like yield, would, the yield. would the gentleman yield to me? Yield to the chairman. Uh, we've talked to legal counsel, and while there are things we would prefer not in the public domain, uh, until we have the hearings. Uh, I don't think it's going to do irreparable damage. It would be better if we didn't release these. But in the spirit of comedy, we will allow these, uh, the, the motion to be made to, to release these documents uh, along with the others on August, 14th. On, August the on August the 14th as requested. Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, would you, you finish with your time? Yield to the yeah, I, I thank you for yielding, and I appreciate the chairman's willingness to agree to our uh, re request, but I want to I read from the statement uh, given by our colleague, uh, uh, Congressman I want to read from the, a, a quote from one of our colleagues. They, meaning those witnesses, are key to various aspects of what some have decided seem to be troubling in some parts of our investigation, but various aspects of who paid whom with what money. Was it Chinese money? Was it businessmen within China? Was it overseas Chinese? Who was it? The immunization of these particular set of witnesses is absolutely essential. That was a claim made by Representative Stephen Horn. We have the statement uh, made as well by uh, uh, Majority Whip Tom DeLay, Irene Wu. Wu was Johnny Chung's office manager and has first-hand knowledge of, John, of Chung's fundraising activities and ties to foreign nationals. Uh, John Shattuck said, it is clear to me that each of these witnesses has substantive significant information which could help us in our investigation. Reclaiming my time. Uh, th th these claims the were made. The now let's let the public re read their deposition. The gentleman my time. reclaims his time. We have agreed to my that. time and it says, John Chattig, Congressman Chattig was very explicit saying will help us lead to Congressman Horn on this committee said it will be a part of and I stand on what I said earlier that some people may have overstated in this committee we understood it was a piece leading to larger pieces I yield back to you. the question is on uh, the motion by the gentleman from Mr. Chairman Texas. in light of uh, the chair's comments regarding uh, your willingness to accept my motion uh, I only included the provision that the depositions be released on or before August 14th as an accommodation to the chair. If you would like for me to restate it and withdraw that and allow the depositions to be released immediately, I would be happy to restate it if you... We'll, 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 we'll uh, let your motion stand. The question is on the motion of the gentleman from Texas. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? The motion carries. Because the director of the FBI, we, we've spent quite a bit of time on this, because the director of the FBI and Mr. LaBella, uh, former head of the task force, are waiting to testify, and we don't want to keep them here all day, I hope we can have an agreement to limit the debate on upcoming motions, which are going to be before the committee, preceding their testimony. Uh, I would like to have unanimous consent to limit debate uh, on each of those to a half an hour. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I... I don't know why they should take, the debate should take any more, than, reserving the right to object, should take any more than a half hour, but I'm always reluctant 
to have a time limit set if members want to speak. We have a large committee, and I, and I don't think members ought to be cut off, but I would hope all members would try to comply with the wish that you are expressing and that I concur in that the debate on any motion not to exceed it uh, any uh, half-hour period. But I do object to uh, uh, an agreement to uh, gag uh, members, not give them a chance to speak. Well, this, uh, the objection is heard, but it's not a, a motion to gag members. It's a motion that was made to try to accommodate two very important people, the head of the FBI and the head of the task force, former head of the task force. Uh, but, uh, uh, objection is heard. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that certain documents relating to Ted Siong, Charlie Tree, and Future Tech International be made publicly available. The, these documents have previously been provided to the committee minority for review and without objection so ordered. Reserving the right to object. Gentleman reserves the right Mr. to object. Mr. Chairman, uh, as I understand it, uh, we did not get uh, even 24 hours notice about uh, the proposed release. We think the Justice Department may have some concerns about the release of these particular documents. Uh, I, I would request of you that we put off the release of these documents uh, to at least have a chance to talk about it in the next couple of days. And if there is no objection by uh, the Justice Department, I won't object. But I do think that we ought to be able to hear from them and uh, to be able to review these documents, not be taken by surprise as, as, to, as to what may be in it and later regret that we release something that could jeopardize the law enforcement uh, and criminal prosecutions. So I would make the objection with the, with the request that uh, we have a couple of uh, days to uh, talk further and uh, and then uh, uh, act after that. So you, you do object? I do object. Okay. I move that uh, certain documents relating to Ted Siong, Charlie Tree, and Future Tech International be made publicly available. These documents have been provided to the minority for their review. I, re I uh, reserve a point of order. And the gentleman will state his point of order. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, under Section C3A of the protocol under which we're operating, the chairman and the ranking minority members shall share uh, their views about uh, a proposal. Shall share their views about a proposal and shall endeavor to reach consensus about the issue. The ranking minority member shall notify the chairman within 24 hours uh, whether he agrees or objects to the proposed release. Uh, in this situation, the chairman has not endeavored to reach consensus about the issue as required under the pro protocol. Uh, in addition, the minority has not been given the minimum 24 hours notice to consider the release. Uh, in fact, the minority did not even receive the Siong and Jimenez documents that the chairman proposes to release until after 3 p.m. yesterday afternoon. Committee Rule 2 is also violated. It requires that every member receive a memorandum three days in advance of a hearing or meeting specifying the purpose of the hearing or meeting and the required notice was not uh, provided in this case. Uh, so I would make the point of order that uh, a, um, a motion to release these documents would not be permitted under the protocol under which we're operating. I also would argue to you it's inappropriate to release the tree documents because DOG has indicated that it opposes the release of these documents. According to the Department of Justice, release of the checks now would inevitably compromise our ability to develop new evidence by alerting witnesses and conspirators about the nature and direction of the investigation. The uh, and that's a, from a letter from Mark Richard, a Deputy Attorney General, to you, Mr. Chairman, on July 30, 1998. It's inappropriate to release the Siong documents at this time. Uh, before these documents are released, the committee should first ask for the Department of Justice's view on the documents. In particular, the committee should seek DOG's views on a number of documents relating to Kent Law under an earlier agreement reached between DOG and this committee. The deposition testimony of Mr. Law would not be made public if DOG J object opposed the release. In a letter dated August 3, 1998, DOJ indicated that public release of the transcript would compromise the department's ongoing criminal investigation. And in light of DOJ's concern, this committee should not release any documents relating to Kent Law without first checking with the, the Department of Justice. So I make a, a point of order that it, under our rules, it's, uh, uh, such a motion would not be in order. And I make an argument against it on the merits uh, as well, 
uh, that we may be jeopardizing criminal prosecutions. I've uh, been informed by the uh, council that uh, during any committee hearing documents uh, can be released and therefore the point of order is not well taken and overruled. Uh, today the committee is going to vote on the release of documents relating to Ted Siong, Mark Middleton, and Yalin Charlie Tree. The Department of Justice has not expressed any objections to the release of the Siong or Middleton documents. However, both the minority and the Department of Justice have expressed reservations about the release of the documents relating to Charlie Tree. As a result, I would like to take a few minutes to address the release of these documents. The Tree documents are composed primarily of financial records that were gathered by this committee as part of its investigation of illegal contributions made to the Democratic National Committee at the direction of Charlie Tree. These records were subpoenaed and analyzed by committee majority staff. The committee did not seek or receive any assistance, any assistance from the Department of Justice in locating or analyzing these financial records. These records were not produced to the committee by the Department of Justice, and as far as I know, no such claim has been made by the Department of Justice. At their most fundamental level, these financial records are congressional documents. The financial records that the committee seeks to release to the American people today are important for a number of reasons. Through the committee's analysis of these records, we have identified a previously unknown source of foreign funds which was used to make illegal contributions to the Democrat National Committee. This is the first time that this committee has traced funds used for conduit contributions directly back to Indonesia. These funds were provided to Tree and ex-Lippo executive Antonio Pan in the form of $200,000 in Bank Central Asia Travelers checks originating in Jakarta, Indonesia, the home of the Riyadis and the Lippo Group. The American people have a right to know who was circumventing our election laws and funneling money into our political system. Time and time again, this committee has sought the assistance of the Clinton administration in identifying the source of foreign funds by obtaining foreign bank records. However, the committee has heard nothing but deafening silence in response. If the president really wants to get at the truth, he should use the full might of the federal government to determine the ultimate source of the funds that illegally influenced our elections. This committee has been stonewalled at every turn, so now we appeal to the public to help us make the progress that only public pressure can produce. While both the Department of Justice and the minority have expressed objections to the release of these traveler's checks, the minority's objections appear to be based entirely upon the Department's objections. As a result, I will address them simultaneously. According to the Department of Justice, quote, release of the checks would now would in inevitably compromise our ability to develop new evidence by alerting witnesses and conspirators about the nature and direction of the investigation, end quote. Well, first, whether to release congressional documents is a decision to be made by Congress. Second, many if not most of the witnesses named on the traveler's checks have already been contacted by the majority staff, the minority staff, and or the Department of Justice. The committee's possession of the traveler's checks is not a well-kept secret to the witnesses involved. Third, the facts indicate that the leads provided in the traveler's checks have not been a top priority for the Justice Department. For example, one individual in New York who received $35,000 in these funds was interviewed by the majority staff on July 15, 1998. Despite having possession of the checks for at least a month prior to the committee's receipt, the Department of Justice only contacted the witnesses on July 22, 1998, immediately after the Democratic staff of this committee notified the Department of Justice about the interview. Equally troubling is the attitude of the Department of Justice's investigators. According to this witness, the Department's investigators minimized the importance of cooperating with congressional investigators by stating that, and this is what the, the fellow that was interviewed said, quote, he was told, Congress is not important. The Department of Justice is more important. This was from a DOJ and an FBI agent, according to the witness. He further indicated that he was told he does not have to talk to congressional investigators. One thing is clear to this congressman. The allegations are further evidence that the Justice Department is an impediment to progress in the 
its investigation. It should be noted that this isn't the first time that the committee has been disappointed and disturbed at the slow pace of the Justice Department's investigation. In August of last year, this committee's majority investigators located Charlie Tree's sister, Man Lin Fong, and her boyfriend, Joseph Landon, both of whom served as conduit contributors on behalf of Charlie Tree. The committee also located David Wang, another conduit contributor. At the time of the committee's interviews of Fong, Landon, and Wang, the Department of Justice had yet to contact any of them. Upon informing the Department of these witnesses, they were immediately called to testify in front of the federal grand jury here in Washington. And again, the committee acts, and then the Department of Justice reacts. Fourth, on prior occasions, the Department has objected to the release of documents, <coughs> and this committee has respected that request. One such example involves the deposition of Kim La, a witness who was granted immunity by this committee a few weeks ago. Just yesterday, on August 3, 1998, the Department of Justice wrote the committee and objected to the release of Mr. La's deposition because, quote, the release would compromise the Department's ongoing criminal investigation, end quote. In that instance, the Department's objections were made in a timely fashion, pursuant to a prior agreement, and were deemed reasonable by the committee in contrast to the present situation. On Tuesday, July 22nd, the majority staff met with minority staff to discuss the release of the traveler's checks. At the conclusion of that meeting, a member of the minority staff indicated that he would consult the Department of Justice concerning the release of checks. Discussions with the minority and the department indicate that the department learned of the committee's desire to release the records no later than Wednesday, July 23rd, 1998. Despite that fact, the department did not express its objections to the release of the checks until Friday, July 31st, a week and a half after they were brought to the department's attention. The department waited until the 11th hour before sending its letter of objection and instead relied upon numerous last-minute telephone calls to emphasize its objections. An additional indication that leads, con that leads contained in these financial documents were not a top priority for the department. Finally, when determining whether to release documents, the committee must weigh the need for confidentiality against the American people's right to know. We take very seriously our mission to inform the public, and the public has been in the dark too long. The American people have a right to know. Chairman. Gentleman from California. I want to talk about this in two respects. There's the rule of law. There are the rules of the committee. Rules are to be followed even if they lead to a conclusion you may not like. The rules of the committee say that the minority ought to get notice, 24-hour notice, before something can be brought up for purposes of a release to the public. That's what the rules say. That was the point of order I made. The chairman said, well, that point of order doesn't apply because there's another rule that says that if there's a hearing, you can release information in the course of the hearing. Well, that doesn't apply to a motion. That applies to any member in the course of interrogating witnesses to refer to documents in interrogating that witness. Well, these documents that the chairman seeks to release are not documents that any member is going to use at this hearing. The chairman proposes to release these documents after this hearing. So that, that's really not what we're talking about. The rules say he's got to give notice. Now, why do the rules say the chairman should give notice? Because people ought to know before we're all agreeing to release something that we're not doing any damage in making information public. Well, I think that the rules are being run roughshod over in the chairman's decision to not abide by the rule and forcing this to a vote. With a gentleman, you'll... No, not yet. I will in a minute. Thank you. Now, he wants to force this to vote because he thinks the public has a right to know. I agree the public has a right to know. But he has in his hands a letter from the Justice Department where it says release of the checks now would inevitably compromise our ability to develop new evidence by alerting witnesses and conspirators about the nature and direction of the investigation. The Justice Department is objecting to release of those checks for that reason. Now, maybe they're right and maybe they're wrong, but I'll tell you, I'm going to go along with the prosecutors when they tell me they don't want their case jeopardized 
by release of information. I think it's irresponsible to, uh, in, notwithstanding this letter, release uh, documents that Justice thinks will hurt their case. Now, the Chairman points out Justice didn't object to some of the other documents being released. But they didn't object for good reason. They didn't know the Chairman was going to release them. That's why we have a notice requirement, so that uh, we could seek the opinion of the Justice Department before documents are released, information is made public. The Chairman has made an incorrect ruling uh, permitting his motion to be made. So what's new about that? The Chairman has ignored the clear statement of the rules that would prohibit this motion from being brought up. What's new about that? Now we're going to see, I expect, a Republican majority vote to release these documents, notwithstanding the fact that Justice says it may jeopardize their investigation. Well, you know, if the Republicans want to vote to jeopardize an investigation, to quote Mr. Souter, history is not going to look very well on them. And we do know that congressional committees can foul up criminal prosecutions. Just remember what happened in the Iran-Contra investigation, where the Congress, in uh, its, uh, its actions, kept uh, the Justice Department and the courts from bringing to justice those who acted improperly. So I, uh, I oppose your motion. I think your ruling was incorrect. Uh, I am not going to appeal the decision and have you bring out your Republican majority to support you. I think you made a wrong decision on the ruling. But notwithstanding that, it is improper, I think, uh, for us to vote to release this, these documents uh, where the Justice Department objects and where the Justice Department hasn't even been given an opportunity uh, to advise us as to whether they think it's going to uh, be detrimental to their prosecution and criminal investigation. Will the gentleman yield briefly? Yes, I yield to you. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding Charlie Tree, the minority has had the Charlie Tree documents for two weeks. And second, we do intend to use some of the uh, checks that we're talking about in the hearing today. And that's why it is relevant, and that's why the ruling was made as it was. Reclaiming my time, the chairman is making the point that these are Congress's documents. I believe they're Congress's documents, the Justice Department documents that have been given to us, but no, they uh, weren't given to us. We we got the documents ourselves. Well, they're, they're documents the Justice is relying on in the prosecution of criminal actions, and I don't think that we ought to be uh, in any way interfering with those criminal actions. I do dispute your statement that you've given us notice. The the fact that staffs may have talked about certain documents did not mean to us that you were going to come in today and release them. And we only were informed that you were going to make that request uh, at 3 o'clock uh, yesterday. I don't think that's a fair way to proceed, and I think it also violates your own rules. The question comes on the motion made by the chair. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. I now move that the committee ratify the chairman's letter to Attorney General Janet Reno dated August 3rd, 1998 and adopt it as the committee's position. Reserving the right to object, I don't know what you're talking about and why do we have to accept your letter as the committee's position? The, as I understand it, uh, when, when a contempt uh, citation, just one second. The House Counsel has said uh, that uh, a letter uh, showing intent uh, solidifies the uh, position of the committee regarding a contempt citation which will be coming later in the week on Thursday. And this was at the suggestion of the House, uh, House Counsel. Well, I do object to unanimous consent. Well, okay, well then uh, I move that the committee ratify the Chairman's letter to Attorney General Janet Reno dated August 3rd and adopt it as the committee's position. Uh, I have moved that the committee ratify my letter of August 3rd to the Attorney General and adopt it as the committee's position. Uh, this letter responds to the Attorney General's refusal to comply with the committee's subpoena for the Free and Labella Memoranda. 
As most of you know, the Attorney General refused to comply with the Committee's subpoena of July 24th, claiming that it would violate long-standing Justice Department policy to produce the Free and Labella Memoranda. However, as my letter points out, this committee is conducting oversight of the Justice Department and is seeking to find out whether the Attorney General is following the law when she refuses to appoint an independent counsel. That is why we have subpoenaed the Free and Labella Memoranda, and that is why we, we will enforce these subpoenas. The Attorney General has never raised a valid claim of privilege in refusing to comply with the subpoena. She has never raised a valid claim of privilege. Rather, she just lists all of the reasons why she is ignoring the subpoena. I have studied these objections and have found that they are either baseless or inapplicable in this case. When the Attorney General claims that the Committee's request is unprecedented, she is simply wrong, incorrect. I have been working with the House General Counsel and the Nonpartisan Congressional Research Service, and they have confirmed that this Committee's subpoena is consistent with the practice of many other committees. We can cite a number of cases ranging from the Teapot Dome scandal to Iran-Contra where congressional committees have demanded and received documents just like the documents that we're talking about now. The Attorney General has raised a number of other complaints about the committee subpoena, and my letter of August 3rd responds to them all. She claims that the subpoena will threaten their investigation. However, she may not want you to know that the subpoena specifically required the Justice Department to redact, cross, eliminate all grand jury information from the memos. We don't want any grand jury testimony that might jeopardize this investigation. The Attorney General has also claimed that the disclosure of the memos will have a chilling effect on her advisor's willingness to render their advice. I ask you, what will have a greater chilling effect? the disclosure of the memos, or the fact that the Attorney General seems to disregard her advisors. We have learned that the Deputy Attorney General and other members of the Attorney General staff have been calling majority members, trying to keep them from voting in favor of, contempt cite, of a contempt citation against the Attorney General. I want the committee to adopt this letter as its official position to show that we take our oversight responsibilities seriously and to show that no one including the Attorney General, can ignore a lawful congressional subpoena. Chairman. Chairman. Who seeks uh, recognition? I do. Gentleman from California. Um, Mr. Chairman, we've had no notice that you were going to make this motion to uh, have the committee adopt your letter as our official position. Uh, I think that you're trying to build a case to hold the Attorney General in contempt of Congress. This is not a frivolous matter, and I don't think it ought to be handled in this way, but it's not inconsistent with the kangaroo court atmosphere that we've seen in this committee in the past and continue to see today. The uh, a chairman is trying to uh, uh, have us take his letter as our uh, catechism, as our official doctrine. Well, that's that's been the way the committee Republicans have treated this investigation. They gave the chairman all the power, and he's abused the power. And let me give everybody an example of an abuse of power. We met last Friday with the Attorney General, and the Attorney General uh, asked the chairman for a three-week period, which she would have an opportunity to review the LaBella memo, talk to her advisors in the Justice Department and reach a conclusion as to whether she would appoint an independent investigator. She asked that the LaBella memo not be turned over, not just because certain facts might be extracted, but uh, Louis Free, who's the director of the FBI, pointed out that it wasn't just the facts that might be extracted, that the, the, the turning over the memo may in other ways jeopardize the criminal prosecution. So both the director of the FBI and the Attorney General asked that they be given three weeks. Now, Chairman Hatch and Chairman Hyde, the chairman of the Judiciary Committees that have jurisdiction over the independent counsel law, have agreed to give her three weeks and to let have her at the end of that period of time come in and brief them. I think 
reasonable request by the Attorney General of the United States. Our chairman said he would not go along with that. He was going to hold her in contempt. He said at that meeting he would vote, presuming his members on the Republican side would support him, to hold her in contempt. But he wouldn't move that contempt citation to the House floor until after the recess. But if she decided, the chairman said to the Attorney General, to appoint an independent counsel, he would not pursue contempt. Now, I've been in the Congress for 24 years, and I've never seen as blatant a strong-arm tactic by any chairman or any member as I saw with our chairman making this threat. What this amounts to is to tell the Attorney General that when she has an issue over which she may have some discretionary decision-making, decision that if she didn't decide as the Chairman wanted, she'd be held in contempt. That, that is a strong-arm tactic. It's a, an intimidation. It's improper. I believe it's a violation of the House ethics rules. It is just uh, the kind of behavior that, that an, an abuse of power that should not be permitted. Now, Mr. Chairman, you may have the Republicans willing again to give you this authority, but I hope they wouldn't. I hope they'd follow the example of Chairman Hyde and Chairman Hatch, who are also good Republicans and who are acting reasonably and responsibly, and not to go to the point now where uh, uh, holding an attorney general in contempt would be so frivolously entered into. I oppose this uh, motion, Mr. Chairman. I will oppose your attempt to hold the Attorney General in contempt. I will uh, oppose these efforts to uh, undermine the investigation and, and prosecution by the people who have the authority to uh, <laughs> take criminal action, the people at the Department of Justice. Let the Attorney General decide the issue of independent counsel, but don't intimidate her to come to the conclusion you want uh, if that's not the appropriate conclusion, as she must decide it for herself. So I, uh, I, I would ask my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to reject this motion. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. 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 Chairman. Before I, I yield, to, yield further, uh, let it, I'd like to submit for the record a letter that I sent to the Honorable Henry Waxman yesterday responding to the uh, inaccurate charges that he just made and uh, this is a matter of public record anybody in the media that wants to see it can Mr. Chairman submitted for the record so without objection so well, 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 reserving the right to object I only to make the unanimous consent request that my letter to you be made part of the that's record. absolutely fine both letters will be submitted for the record Mr. Chairman Mr. Chairman uh, Mr. Chairman Mr. Chairman who, who seeks time Chairman Mr. Chairman uh, I think it's okay, our I, I just want you uh, I yield but uh, uh, I think it's important since we have Mr. <laughs> Free and Mr. LaBella here waiting that we try to uh, restrict our comments as much as possible because th we're going to be keeping them here all day. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I seek recognition Mr. to make Mr. a motion. Point of Mr. Micah. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would uh, be glad to make a motion uh, for the previous question on this and limit, but I don't want to limit debate if their side doesn't want to uh, do that. Otherwise, I'd like to comment on the need uh, for uh, including this in the record. Would the chair be gentleman's recognized uh, I moved the previous question mr. Uh, chairman I asked to be recognized prior to that I asked to be recognized prior to mr. Michael would withdraw I, I, I want a regular keep, order I, 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 it, one second I want to keep a spirit of comedy as much as possible if we move the previous question we could have uh, problems we've experienced right. before so then would you, would you withhold that chairman then thank you I uh, withdraw my uh, motion and uh, ask to be recognized uh, mr. chairman um, I believe this is a, a very serious uh, matter uh, that we and predicament that we find ourselves in. Uh, holding the Attorney General in contempt is a serious action and should be very carefully considered uh, uh, by this committee. Uh, this is this is really the second action. If you'll recall, we had uh, uh, Mr. Free and the Attorney General before us before. Uh, and in somewhat an embarrassing situation, this committee has really read what's in these reports. Uh, first, uh, uh, last uh, December, I believe it was in the uh, New York Times. Uh, we've read this, 
the alleged statements of the uh, uh, FBI <coughs> director who reviewed uh, the, the matter at that point and said he'd never seen a uh, more compelling situation for which there should be appointed an independent counsel. Now this committee is again faced with reading in the newspaper information that we're trying to obtain. Again, Mr. Labella, who uh, after discussions with this committee uh, was put in charge of that investigation, has done a job and we're learning that he too is recommending an independent counsel. Almost every newspaper in the United States, and not particularly uh, friends of our side of the aisle, ha have uh, commented. Let me read just a few of them. The New York Times, July 23rd. The two people in American government who know most about this case, the lead prosecutor and the top investigator, are convinced that the trail of potentially illegal money leads so clearly toward the White House that Ms. Reno cannot, uh, under federal law, be allowed to supervise the investigation of her own boss. Either she has to come forward and make the impossible argument that they are incompetent or bow to the law's requirement. Around the country, the Seattle Times said, LaBella's conclusion shreds Reno's long-held arguments against a special prosecutor for Clinton fundraising. Plainly, she is wrong. She must invoke the act or consider whether a different attorney general should make the call. The Dallas Morning News. So why does Ms. Reno still resist appointing an independent counsel to examining the worsening affair? Her own Justice Department has even turned up a smoldering pile of trash. The Philadelphia Inquirer. She, Reno, should long ago have called for an independent counsel, not simply to look into those trivial phone calls, but take the whole sleazy, dispiriting story of how the 1996 races for the White House was financed. The Arkansas Democrat, in conclusion, you don't have to like independent counsels to see that this is the kind of investigation they were made for. This is a very serious matter before an investigation and oversight uh, committee of Congress. There is certainly a sufficient record and evidence for requesting this type of information from other executive uh, uh, officers of government. And uh, we should uh, clearly set the record with the chairman's uh, statement. It should be approved as our position and then move forward on Thursday as we uh, have the obligation and right uh, to do. Thank you. And I yield back Mr. my time. The chairman yields back to balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Chairman. California. <clears throat> Just a couple of points, Mr. Chairman. I think your threatening the Attorney General is the arrogance of power run amok. And I believe that uh, your attempt to have your letter declared the view of this committee, which is made up of independent individuals elected by their constituents, some of whom do not share your view, is palpably absurd. This is not our letter, this is your letter. And if there will be a vote on it, we will see what that vote is. Presumably, you will have the majority agree with you that it is their letter. You will get a no vote from me, because it surely is not my letter. But to get on with the job of this morning's hearing, I would like to point out an incredible degree of hypocrisy which we can set straight in one minute. You are complaining that the FBI director is kept waiting. Well, the FBI director is kept waiting because you are bringing up one controversial issue after another, which you want to bulldoze through this committee and you're not going to succeed. So I would like to suggest, to accommodate the distinguished director of the FBI, that you withdraw your motion, we invite the FBI director to testify, and after we have heard from him and others, you will be free to reintroduce your motion. But the, the hypocrisy that you display by presenting these emotionally charged and highly controversial issues 
and objecting to our discussing these and then complaining that we are blocking the appearance of the FBI director boggles the mind. You withdraw your motion, we invite the, the FBI director to testify and he won't have to spend the whole day here. But if you keep raising one controversial issue after another and want to railroad this through without debate and without objection, the FBI director will be here the whole day and maybe tomorrow. So I ask you to withdraw your motion. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. I don't. Mr. Haster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm going to be very brief, and hopefully plain spoken. You know, a long time ago, beginning of this session, Congress, we talked about working in comedy. You're trying to talked about working to, to follow and meet the ends and the purposes of our committees. Clearly, we've heard words like hypocrisy and sham and all types of emotive language today. It certainly doesn't help us get our job done here. I would hope that, you know, with the jurisdiction that this committee has, uh, we do have oversight of this issue. We need to go forward and see who's doing their job and who's not doing their job. And this very focused issue of <clears throat> the recommendations made to the Attorney General and whether she takes those uh, recommendations or not, we need to know what those recommendations are. We need to hear the testimony. I th think, uh, certainly in my opinion, that the Chairman of this committee uh, has done what he has been counseled to do, especially in this last motion. It's something uh, that certainly will probably come down to a partisan roll call vote. If that is the case, let's move on and take the vote. And uh, to posture and to debate and to uh, delay the purpose of this committee today is certainly not in anybody's best interest, uh, whether you're the head of the FBI or we happen to be ahead of a, another committee in this Congress. Uh, we need to move forward. We need to get this job done at hand. And um, to delay and to debate and to fluster about this certainly doesn't get the job done that we're here to do. So I would hope, Mr. Chairman, that we can take this vote as Gentlemen, soon as possible and yield. move forward. I'd be happy to yield to my friend from California. Before you go to the vote, and as you say, perhaps on a party line basis, I'd like to show you a clip of Senator Hatch what he had to say on this issue, because I think uh, let it's me important for the Republican time. members Let me reclaim see my time. If you want to do that, I think you probably well, I thought we that. maybe could avoid some of the further debate and oh, if that's get that an agreement, there. I would do that. I'm not making any agreement about anybody else's rights, but I think it's important if we could see it. If yeah, the, I, I would yield to the gentleman. Let, the, let me yeah. just say that uh, before you show the tape, and that's fine with me, uh, I know it's not very long, <laughs> Uh, I talked with uh, Chairman Hyde yesterday. <laughs> Chairman Hyde is supportive of what this committee is doing. He told me that uh, in an unqualified way. He said that yesterday. Uh, I have talked to, uh, or my staff has talked to former attorneys general who concur with the actions that we're taking. And so uh, while I have great respect for uh, uh, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Mr. Hatch, uh, his uh, view is uh, not necessarily the only view. We do have uh, Congressman Hyde, and we do have former attorneys general that agree with the actions that we're taking. With that, if I'll yield back to the gentleman. The gentleman would permit. I would permit. Before you go, Charles LaBella, who heads up the Justice Department's investigation into campaign fundraising allegations of abuse, Louis Free, the director of the FBI, nonpartisan. And Mr. DeSarno, who's the other investigator. Are all recommending to the attorney general the of an independent counsel to look at fundraising abuses. And Janet Reno, as we speak this morning, says no. Well, she doesn't say no. I just chatted with her uh, uh, two nights ago. And she wants about three weeks to really review the 100 page or so, well, I think 100 page document from Mr. DeBella. She's certainly going to re review the, uh, the FBI director's uh, memorandum where he said it's hard to think of a case where you need an independent counsel more than this one. DeBella seemed to say that she has misinterpreted the statute. And then DeSarno is the other investigator who, uh, is, who's a uh, freeze-top investigator who agrees that DeSarno, that, that the uh, LaBella 
memorandum is right. So here you have the top two investigators, the top prosecutor, recommending that she, that she has to request the appointment of an independent counsel. I believe she'll do the right thing in the end, but I told her that I'd be happy to give her that time. She's agreed to sit down with Chairman Hyde and me uh, sometime near the end of this month and uh, and discuss where, what her position will be and discuss those memoranda with us. She so doesn't, you, you she doesn't you, want to give up the memoranda because she claims that it's a blueprint of their uh, prosecutorial investigation. investigation. That isn't necessarily a, a good answer, but the fact is is that uh, we're not going to subpoena those until uh, we sit down with her probably towards the end of this month, and I hope she'll live up to the statute and do the right thing. I uh, reclaim my time. <clears throat> I would just like to say that uh, certainly we've had the testimony from the gentleman from the other body, uh, not in person, but here, and uh, they have their opinions and we have ours, and I think we need to move forward and yield back my time. Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Chairman. Did, I'd just like to say the ranking minority member, I hope that did expedite this a little bit uh, and maybe we can move on to the vote uh, Mr. as Chairman. as possible. Uh, Mr. Fatah, I think, is the, the next member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will try to be as concise as possible. I, I would uh, speak in opposition to the, uh, the motion offered by the Chairman. I think that the, uh, the Senator and his comments and also uh, uh, what we to know of this whole matter is that uh, Janet Reno has not been adverse to appointing independent counsels in the past in this administration. She has a view of the statute. It is the statute that was crafted by this Congress that gave her the ultimate decision making uh, in this matter. And I, I think that it's unfortunate that the recommendations of some of her top assistants and aides have, have become so public. But nonetheless, uh, if, if it is true that she met with you and she's asked for a few weeks, I think given her service to this country, given the high esteem that the American public uh, holds her in, that we would do a disservice to the reputation of this committee and to the members thereon if we would act in a rash uh, and uh, what may seem to be reckless manner. I know we've been accused of that as a committee in the past, and uh, I don't think that we should put ourselves uh, in front of the Judiciary Committees in the House and in the Senate who have principal uh, oversight responsibilities for the uh, Justice Department, nor do I think that we should uh, automatically assume uh, that uh, the Attorney General is not interested in pursuing aggressively uh, these matters. Uh, it is of note that there have been uh, two major high-profile convictions uh, with both uh, jail and multi-million dollar penalties assessed uh, for illegal campaign contributions uh, in the 1996 presidential election, both of them uh, in the manner of assisting the Republican presidential uh, campaign and campaign organizations. It is of note that uh, the Republican National Committee has tried to withhold uh, some 95 documents from the grand jury uh, that the Justice Department has seated looking into this matter. Uh, so there seems to be some uh, aggressiveness in the Justice Department looking for wrongdoing. Maybe it's not as partisan uh, in its focus as this committee has been accused of in the past. They seem to be looking for, you know, people who are doing uh, uh, things that are illegal irrespective of a party. This committee has not found time to look at the triad management organization or any of the allegations relative to Republican wrongdoing. And I think that that has done a disservice to our reputation. I think Gentlemen. favorable consideration of this motion would do further damage to this committee's reputation. Gentlemen, Thank yield. you. I'd be glad to yield. I thank you for yielding. Look, I don't want this committee to be a committee out of control and recklessly uh, careen into a uh, confrontation with the Attorney General that's unnecessary. The only thing I'd ask our Republican colleagues to do is to consider the words and actions of Senator Hatch. That you ought to at least, in the spirit of comedy, give the Attorney General a chance to make a reasoned decision before you criticize her. She ought to decide the issue first. And I, I just think it's, it's uh, important to note that the chairman of this committee uh, strong-armed and tried to intimidate the attorney general. That's an abuse of power. Let's get on the right track and let Senator Hatch be the model for this committee uh, and the committee's actions. And I urge my Republican colleagues uh, to defeat this motion. I thank you for yielding. This is the gentleman, Mr. Fatah, do you yield back to balance your time? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Scarborough. 
just a couple of comments. Uh, I, I, I can't help but think it's deja vu all over again when I hear the quotes, committee out of control, abuse of power, strong arm tactics. These are the exact term and terms that were used several years ago when Bill Klinger was chairman of this committee and we tried to get some information from the White House. Exact terms being used. And what we found out after we got those documents when we had to threaten contempt charges, we found out that this White House illegally seized 900 FBI files of political enemies. I mean, we've been there, we've done that. I heard every member on the, the Democratic side make these same arguments. They voted unanimously to stop us from getting the information that led to the trail that helped us uncover 900 FBI files being seized. And yet we hear about strong arm tactics. Uh, the ranking member, who, who I uh, have respect for, said that these were the, str the, the, the worst strong arm tactics he's ever seen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I suppose you should be uh, docile like uh, uh, former Chairman Dingell, Jack Brooks, Dan Rostenkowski, and the like. Also, we hear about the high reputation for Ms. Reno. The New York Times recently editorialized that her chief legacy could be obstructing justice quote, in the most serious fundraising scandal since Watergate. I don't know that she's held in high esteem across the country on editorial boards from the left or the right on this matter. I, I, I think you'd have to reach very far to uh, find an editorial board that agrees with her. I also think you'll have to reach a long, long distance to try to find, maybe, uh, maybe up in Vermont you might be able to find an editorial board that would cite a moral equivalency between the Republican fundraising abuses of 1996 and the Democratic fundraising abuses of 1996. That's also quite a stretch. Uh, I think, uh, like uh, my friend from Indiana has said before, history will not be friendly to those that continue to uh, to stand in the way of these investigations and have continued since we've tried to get FBI file uh, information several years ago under Bill Klinger's leadership and now trying to get to the bottom of what the New York Times calls the most serious fundraising scandal since Watergate. Uh, and I don't think, like the New York Times said, history will be very uh, kind to Miss Reno either. Uh, but I am glad that, uh, that my Democratic friends uh, do think that we should follow the leadership of Chairman Hatch, who said one week ago, on one of these Sunday talk shows that uh, if Miss Reno didn't step forward and appoint this independent counsel, then she may be forced to resign. And with that, I yield to the gentleman it, from Indiana. Let, let, me, let me just say that when new information comes to the Attorney General regarding an independent counsel, uh, I think the statute says she is supposed to make a decision within 30 days. She's had well over two weeks now since the Labello memo got to her, maybe a little bit more than two weeks, maybe three weeks. She's asking for three more weeks, which would make it six weeks. We will be out of session for two weeks after that, which makes it eight weeks. So we're looking at the earliest that Congress could take any action, nine weeks. And the concern that I have had from day one when the investigation started was the White House and everybody concerned with this investigation on the other side has been dragging it out and dragging it out and dragging it out. Uh, you know, she, she can make her decision. She can make her decision if she chooses to do so. What we're talking about today is a contempt citation because she is not obeying a subpoena, a legal subpoena that has legal precedent from the Congress of the United States. That's what we're talking about. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, would the gentleman yield just for a second, just a bit in perspective? And we saw the video tape from our friend from the Senate. But you know, you need to put the Senate in perspective, uh, in good humor. Uh, Mr. The, the same chairman that we just had, who's a good friend of mine, has been sitting on the drug czar reauthorization for over a year before they've moved that bill out. I mean, I think they run on six-year terms. And, uh, I mean, their time is a relative thing. It's different from how we see time here. And, uh, you know, I just think we need to move forward and do the business of the House. It's different from the business of the Senate. And uh, let's do it in a reasoned uh, uh, way that we can move forward and get things done. I uh, yield back to the gentleman from Florida. Gentleman yields back to balance this time. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Could, could we just take one more person and then vote on this? Uh, That's is there another person, yes. Okay, I, I'll, I'll yield to the gentleman. Then I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Micah had it right when he said this is a serious action that you're asking us to consider, and it should be seriously considered by this committee. And I don't think that showing us a letter that was 
uh, dated yesterday and made available to us today is actually giving us the opportunity to take seriously this action and seriously consider, particularly when in that letter you assert that the majority of members of the committee come to a conclusion that you uh, believe you've arrived at, when I'm not aware of any vote of this committee establishing that fact. You know, given the comments of Mr. Waxman in the two underlying letters that you and he have exchanged, uh, an attempt by the chair to obtain a vote on the letter based on yesterday, I think, is premature and doesn't give this committee the opportunity that it should. But beyond that, talking about comedy and talking about giving people in the executive branch the opportunity to conduct their business even within the time that they're allotted, uh, you're trying to move forward and shorten up the 30 days that the Attorney General would ordinarily have to make a decision on this. I have great concern. I think the committee should be concerned uh, that we might be interfering with the exercise of her discretion and her consideration of the advice facts before her. She's asked for three weeks to review a 100-page legal document in the <coughs> FBI Director's previous memorandum. Chairman Hyde and Senator Hatch, uh, the operative committees believe that that's reasonable. Uh, that doesn't seem to me that we're asking anything unreasonable to say that she should be given that deference in view of her position, in view of the seriousness and the importance of this matter. And I suspect that we should do that. And we should not be put in the position of, by surprise, voting on a presumption that you probably improperly made, or I would suggest inaccurately made in your letter, trying to verify or ratify uh, those incorrect conclusions. And Mr. Chairman, I would move that we lay upon the table your motion. Motion has Gentlemen, been made. I, I move the table. You move to table the tabling motion? I don't think that's... Uh, it's not debatable, Mr. Chairman. The motion, the motion made by Mr. Tierney to lay the motion I have made on the table is non-debatable. Uh, all those in favor of Mr. Tierney's uh, motion will signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I'd ask for a roll call vote, Mr. Chairman. We'll withdraw that. Apparently, the ranking member can count. The question now, the question now comes on the motion made by the chair. All those in favor will signify I, I, by on saying. On this one, I, I think we ought to have a roll call. This is the one where okay, you well, want to be given okay. this extraordinary uh, authority. Just, just one second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The gentleman from California. Roll call vote. Request a roll call vote, and a roll call vote will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes aye. Mr. Cox? Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Aye. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. McIntosh votes aye. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Scarborough votes aye. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Aye. Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Aye. Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Snowbarger? Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Lewis? Mr. Lewis votes aye. Mr. Waxman? Mr. Waxman votes no. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? 
Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Condent? Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? No. Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Fatah votes no. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Bogoyevich votes no. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Davis of Illinois votes no. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen votes no. Mr. Ford? Mr. Ford votes no. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Towns? Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Condent? Mrs. Maloney? Clerk, clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, there are 23 ayes and 15 nays. Motion has carried. We will now move to the witnesses that we have uh, to appear before us today. Would you ask the witnesses to come in, please? I want to uh, welcome my good friend Louis Free and Mr. LaBella and Mr. DeSarno. I, I apologize for keeping you waiting. I hope uh, the people in the back treated you well and bought you a Coke or something. So uh, I apologize for the length of uh, your wait. Before we uh, ask you to be sworn in, I'd like to make an opening statement, and uh, I presume uh, Mr. Waxman will as well. Today we are meeting for the second time in eight months to review Attorney General Janet Reno's handling of the independent counsel law. Over the last eight months, the two Justice Department officials who are closest to the investigation of illegal fundraising have told the Attorney General that she must appoint an independent counsel. To date, she has stubbornly refused. Last November, FBI Director Louis Free wrote a 27-page memo urging Ms. Reno to appoint an independent counsel. In his own words, he said, quote, it is difficult to imagine a more compelling situation for appointing an independent counsel." End quote. Louis Free is not just another face in the crowd. He is a former FBI agent. He is a former federal prosecutor. He is a formal, former federal judge. And Attorney Janet Reno dismissed his advice. Two weeks ago, Assistant U.S. Attorney Charles LaBella again urged Janet Reno to appoint an independent counsel. 
He has run a task force investigation of foreign money in our elections for the last 10 months. Janet Reno handpicked Mr. LaBella for this job because of his sparkling credentials and his reputation as an outstanding prosecutor. I can't think of anyone in America who is in a better position to know the facts. Now, Mr. LaBella wrote the Attorney General a detailed 120-page report with 55 exhibits explaining why an independent counsel is needed. According to the press, Mr. LaBella's memo makes the case that this investigation goes to the highest levels of the White House. The Wall Street Journal reported yesterday that Mr. LaBella's report focuses heavily on Harold Ickes, the former Deputy White House Chief of Staff. Let me quote what one senior government official told the Wall Street Journal. Quote, it's not exactly that we presented her with a smoking gun, but we showed her significant threads of evidence that went right into the White House and to the upper levels of the Democrat National Committee. End quote. Two weeks have gone by and there's absolutely no sign that the Attorney General has budged an inch. The press has reported that the FBI agent in charge of the task force, James DeSarno, also believes that an independent counsel should be appointed. I don't know if this is true or not, but Mr. DeSarno is here today and we're going to ask him. So let's look at what we have. The two career law enforcement officials, and maybe three, with the most extensive knowledge of this case have urged the Attorney General to seek an independent counsel. They have both told her that criminal conduct in this case could go all the way to the highest levels of the White House. And Janet Reno has stood like Horatius at the bridge and refused to move this investigation out of the Justice Department. It looks to me like the Attorney General is ignoring the advice of the career professionals running this investigation. It looks to me like that she is only listening to the political appointees that have surrounded her. Time and again we are seeing career professionals being ignored. We are seeing long memos written. We are seeing details from these memos showing up in the newspapers again and again. And let's be honest here, these aren't memos, these are cries for help. The sad thing is it should never have gotten to this point. It is painfully obvious that you cannot investigate your own boss. The Attorney General cannot credibly investigate the President who appointed her. Look at how the same situation was handled during the Reagan administration. When Iran-Contra came to light in the fall of 1996, within one month, Attorney General Meese applied for an independent counsel, and the President, President Reagan, publicly asked him to do so. Now look at the same situation and how it's handled in the Clinton administration. Attorney General has blocked an independent counsel for over a year and a half. The President remains silent. FBI Director Louis Free recommended an independent counsel and she rejected him out of hand. When Director Free's memo came to light, he was greeted with a smear campaign from the White House and anonymous aides of the President sniping at him in the press. That's just shameful. Look at the list of people who have called for an independent counsel. President Jimmy Carter, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Senator Russell Feingold, and the ranking member of this committee, Mr. Waxman, called for an independent counsel over a year ago. Former Deputy Attorney General Philip Hyman called for an independent counsel. He was quoted in the press as saying that he'd served in seven administrations and that he'd never seen a Justice Department so dominated by the White House. I'll tell you what it looks like to me, and I think it looks this way to a lot of people. It looks like to me that the Attorney General is trying to protect the President. As everyone knows by now, I have issued a subpoena for the Free Memo and the LaBello Memo. The Attorney General has refused to comply, even though the subpoena clearly states that grand jury evidence can be removed. Yesterday I filed a contempt report and I have scheduled a committee meeting for Thursday morning to consider a resolution of contempt for failure to turn over subpoenaed documents to Congress. We have talked to some former attorneys general who concur with our thinking. The department has said that it is their long-standing policy not to provide materials on open cases to Congress. In most cases, that's probably a pretty good policy. However, as a matter of law, Congress's needs in exercising oversight of the executive branch outweigh any agency's internal policies. The only alternative to complying with a lawful congressional subpoena is to claim executive privilege, and that has not happened. It has been said that this subpoena is unprecedented. I have been told that the Justice Department has never turned over material like this before. Now that's wrong. That's flat out wrong. 
I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a study prepared by the Congressional Research Service. In this study, you will see a litany of instances in which the Justice Department was required to turn over even more extensive materials to the Congress. The list stretches as far back as the Teapot Dome scandal in the 20s. Similar documents were turned over to Congress during the investigation of Billy Carter's ties to Libya. Similar information was turned over to Congress during the Abscam investigation. During the Iran-Contra investigation, the House and Senate Iran-Contra committees, which were controlled by the Democrats, ordered the Justice Department to turn over all of its files about Attorney General Mises' preliminary investigation. The Justice Department objected, but Congress prevailed. So it's clear to see that this subpoena to turn over two memos is far from unprecedented. It's clear that when wrongdoing has been alleged at the Department of Justice, Congress has an obligation to investigate and Congress has received exactly this kind of information before. Under normal circumstances, I probably wouldn't ask the Justice Department to turn over this kind of information, but these are not normal circumstances. Let's take a minute to review what's happened. Last December, Director Free testified before this committee that he believed that both sections of the Independent Counsel Act had been triggered, discretionary and mandatory. In other words, he believed that the Department had received specific and credible information about covered individuals and that she had to appoint an independent counsel under the law. According to what we read in the press, Mr. Labella's memo again states that both the discretionary and mandatory provisions of the law have been triggered. According to the New York Times, Mr. Labella concluded that the Attorney General had created an artificially high standard of evidence to avoid triggering the law. This is pretty shocking. If the director of the FBI says the attorney general must apply for an independent counsel under the mandatory provisions of the law, and if he's correct, and if the prosecutor who runs the task force says that she must apply for an independent counsel under the mandatory provisions of the law, and if he's correct, then this is not just a case of bad judgment. If this is true, then the attorney general of the United States is breaking the law. If the attorney general is not obeying the law, then the Congress and the American people have a right to know it, and we have an obligation to get the facts. That's why we need these memos. I know that when Director Free and Mr. Labella testify today, they will say they don't want Congress to have these memos. I understand their concerns. They are institutional concerns, and I respect them. But I have to say that we have an unprecedented situation here. We have never seen a situation like this in which an attorney general has refused repeated pleas from her professional advisors to appoint an independent counsel. In this situation, Congress has an obligation to conduct oversight. The legitimate needs of Congress must take precedence over the institutional concerns of any agency. So I respect the concerns of Mr. Free and Mr. Labella, but the committee has an obligation to pursue this matter. It is inexcusable that the newspapers know more about these memos than the members of this committee. The Attorney General has to follow the law and she has to respect the lawful authority of Congress. When the gentleman from California makes his opening statement in a minute, he's going to say that I strong-armed the Attorney General last week. In fact, he's already said that. He's going to tell everyone that I threatened to hold her in contempt if she does not appoint an independent counsel. I feel a little bit like Yogi Berra when he said this is deja vu all over again. Every time things get a little heated around here, I get attacked by somebody. Well, let's set the record straight. First, I issued this subpoena for the Free and the Labella memos, nothing else. Second, the Attorney General has refused to comply with the subpoena despite the fact that it clearly states that grand jury material can be redacted, crossed out. Third, this committee will vote on a resolution of contempt this Thursday, Thursday solely because the Attorney General refused to turn over the documents, period. End of story. Everything else is just heated rhetoric. Now the Attorney General has asked us to give her three more weeks while she reviews this memo. Because the August recess is approaching and because the session will wind down very quickly when we return, I'm not willing to let this matter sit for long. Given Ms. Reno's track record, I'm very skeptical that she's going to change her mind. I quote the Washington Post from July 24th. Janet Reno appears no closer to supporting such an outside probe than when the idea was first suggested 21 months ago, Justice Department officials said yesterday. I quote the New York Times from July 23rd, there was no indication today that the Attorney General seemed likely to reconsider her position in any of these instances. This subpoena is not unprecedented. It is necessary and it is proper. 
The Attorney General knows that any grand jury information may be deleted from the memo. We don't want grand jury information. All we want are the reasons Director Free and Mr. LaBella told the Attorney General why they told her she should appoint an independent counsel. The Justice Department has an obligation to comply with lawful congressional subpoenas, and we have an obligation to hold them to that standard, unless they claim executive privilege, which has not taken place. Let me conclude by quoting a short passage from a New York Times editorial from July 23rd. I think it says it all about the importance of this issue and why Congress cannot sit idly by. Quote, the two people in the American government who know most about this case, the lead prosecutor and the top investigator are convinced that the trail of potentially illegal money leads so clearly toward the White House that Ms. Reno cannot, under federal law, be allowed to supervise the investigation of her own boss. When it comes to campaign law, this is the most serious moment since Watergate." End quote. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and I yield to my colleague from California. Mr. Chairman, over a year and a half ago, I recommended that we have an independent counsel and that we have one committee in the House and the Senate conduct an investigation about the campaign system, wrongdoing, abuses, and hopefully leading to reform. If that recommendation had been accepted, we would have saved millions of taxpayers' dollars which have been wasted by this committee particularly, but by the redundancy of two committees doing the same job. Now that was my recommendation for an independent counsel under that context, which I thought made sense. But there's an independent counsel law, and in some circumstances the Attorney General is required to appoint an independent counsel. Under some other circumstances, she has the discretion. She has advisors telling her what they think is appropriate. She is now in the process of evaluating further recommendations to her. She asked for three weeks so that she could review these issues and make her own decision. Senator Hatch and Congressman Hyde have both thought that three weeks was not an unreasonable request. Evidently, our chairman thinks it is unreasonable to give her three weeks because, he says, it may be wrongdoing if she decides that she does not think an independent counsel is required. Well, there are disputes lawyers have that are often honest and legitimate. It is not wrongdoing to conclude one way as opposed to another. It may not suit your political purposes, but it is not wrongdoing. But I think the chairman's view is instructive as to what's going on, because there was no ambiguity at that meeting last Friday with the Attorney General. Mr. Burton told Attorney General Reno that he would hold her in contempt by a vote of this committee, but he wouldn't pursue the matter if she appointed an independent uh, counsel. That to me is not uh, ambiguous in any way. He was, the message was very clear. She could avoid contempt by reaching the decision that Chairman Burton wanted. I think that's an abuse of power. To my knowledge, he's become the first chairman in the history of the Congress to s use the contempt power to try to improperly influence a decision in a pending criminal investigation. Now, it appears that this committee may be intent on following its chairman to the conclusion of reaching a contempt vote on Thursday. I would say to the Attorney General that contempt is almost always a serious matter that Congress handles responsibly. But if the chairman is, is, is intent on pursuing uh, this uh, matter, I would tell her to consider the source. This isn't Chairman Hyde. This isn't Chairman Hatch. 
moving to contempt. It is not the committee which has been uh, given the jurisdiction over the, those matters. This is the committee that I believe has been thoroughly discredited. This committee has been discredited by a series of mistakes, bad judgment, partisan overreaching, and extremism. Someone told me our committee has become the congressional equivalent of the crazy ant in the attic. So I would tell the Attorney General to consider the source. Attorney General even called the chairman this morning and requested to testify because the three witnesses that are here today serve under her. And she said if, they're, if those people that serve under her as part of this criminal investigation are going to be questioned, she wanted to be here to respond as well. The chairman even refused that request. The chairman insisted on releasing information that Mr. Free and Mr. LaBella opposed releasing this morning. The chairman will emphasize the judgment and experience of Mr. Free and Mr. LaBella in endorsing their call for an independent counsel. But he ignores their views when it comes to safeguarding the case that they are managing. The chairman mentioned that uh, several previous attorney generals have been consulted. I would hope that he'd tell us the name of one. If even one, let alone the several attorneys general that have been consulted on this matter, I don't believe that statement is accurate. I will in a minute yield to you. I, I just want to reemphasize what we've seen in this morning's hearing, let alone what we've seen in the past experience of our committee. We've seen partisan grandstanding. We recall we were told that if we didn't grant immunity to the four witnesses, we'd never know from those people who have direct knowledge about how the Chinese government made illegal campaign contributions in an att apparent attempt to influence our policy. We granted immunity. We've taken those depositions. We're going to have the release finally, begrudgingly, but nevertheless finally, of three of those witnesses. The four witnesses, I believe, don't know anything about transferring technology to China. They don't know anything about possible campaign contributions from the Chinese government, and they don't know anything that is of relevance to this committee's investigation. But that appears to be of apparently little concern to our chairman, because it's grandstanding, not the truth, that invariably grabs headlines. Mr. Chairman, I'm looking forward to the testimony of these witnesses. I think this matter ought to be pursued with seriousness and competence and fairness. I regret that our committee is not handling itself in that manner. The gentleman yield to... And I'd be pleased to yes. yield to you. Uh, the Attorney General called us uh, about 15 minutes before the hearing was to begin to ask if she could testify. And uh, I told her we would certainly grant her wish at some future date, but uh, as a courtesy to the members on both sides of the aisle, uh, we didn't think that uh, we should spring that on them where they might not be prepared to ask her questions. And what I'd like to ask the gentleman from California is if she called me at 15 minutes till 10, how did you know that she requested to come before the committee? Well, I, I would uh, be pleased to give you that information. She yeah. called me in advance and asked uh. whether she should call you to re make that request uh. or whether she ought to show up. I and I su su suggested she call you. Uh. She also said last Friday that she would like you not to have this hearing uh, and not to uh, ask these three witnesses to come forward. But if you were going to have the hearing to have her uh, deputy here and you denied her that. But I yielded to you for another purpose. And I want to yield to you again for another purpose. You have claimed that you've talked to a former attorneys general who have advised you on this matter, and I'd like to know which attorneys general you've talked to. I talked to, uh, my staff uh, talked to uh, at least three, 
and uh, I'm not going to uh, divulge their names, but I will tell you that uh, I'm. That's a very accurate statement. Well, there can't we, be that. There can't be that many attorneys general well, that are still alive. Well, then you can figure it out. I, I, I don't. I don't know if you're trying to, to withhold their names for their uh, privacy and or security or protection, but or because uh, perhaps uh, that uh, the fact of your consultation is not accurate, Mr. Chairman. I, I I won't go any further on this opening statement. I think these witnesses have waited an extraordinary amount of time. I regret that uh, we had these issues sprung on us this morning without notice, uh, as you try to prepare your case, and uh, I think uh, that the House will fully consider where this uh, case is coming from and uh, not to uh, take uh, your recommendations if you should ever pursue a uh, contempt uh, citation. Yield back to the Council. The Mark. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman, real quickly. Mr. Chairman, thank you for recognizing me. I just want to make uh, a statement for the record uh, that I was unduly delayed at a meeting of the Intelligence Committee at the, uh, on the taking of motion, the vote on motion four by Chairman. Burton and I, had I been present, I would have voted in support of the Chairman's motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would you gentlemen please rise? Uh, Mr. Free, I understand that uh, you wanted to start with an opening statement, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, with your permission. Proceed. Okay. Um, Good morning uh, to you, Mr. Waxman, members of the committee. Um, I've submitted a written statement, but with your permission, I'd like to just summarize very quickly uh, what's contained therein. Uh, first of all, um, I appreciate the opportunity again to appear before the committee. Uh, I'd also like to begin just by uh, expressing my condolences again to the families of officers uh, Chestnut and Gibson, which I know put all of us, uh, but particularly uh, the Congress and those of us in law enforcement in just a very uh, sad and mournful mood last week. Uh, and I think it's a great tribute to them and their families, the uh, turnout and the support that they were given by the members. Many of the officers expressed that to me, and I just wanted to briefly mention that this morning. I'd also like to thank the committee, uh, everyone on the committee and your staff for uh, handling a lot of the very sensitive and classified information that we've provided to you over the last few months, and particularly uh, the briefing which uh, we provided, which summarized the memo at issue, at least between myself and the Attorney General. I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Waxman, for the very confidential way in which that was handled, and we appreciate that very much. When I appeared before you last uh, December, uh, I did, as you know, uh, state and discuss during the questions and answers my recommendation to our Attorney General, which was uh, a recommendation that she do appoint an independent counsel, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, both on the uh, discretionary grounds as well as the mandatory grounds under the independent counsel statute. You also know that I uh, talked about that with great reservations in December, uh, and I did not, prior to that time, in any public way disclose that recommendation. And I, um, I still have great reservations, not only about discussing uh, the recommendation, but certainly supplying the details and the arguments that support that uh, for all the reasons that I set forth in December. With respect to my written memorandum to the Attorney General, um, it should be noted that we had additional discussions between the committee, the FBI, and the Department of Justice and really worked out what I thought was a commendable agreement and compromise to the credit of this committee. We decided, and the committee decided, uh, after very, uh, I thought, uh, laudatory conversations, that we would uh, deal with the matter by supplying to the committee leadership here a confidential briefing which set forth in some detail the contents of my memorandum without having the public disclosure of both those uh, summarized contents as well as the underlying details. And I think that balance was important both for the purposes of achieving the committee's uh, necessary oversight, but also balancing the uh, reasons and the concerns that I still have about making the details of that recommendation public. 
when I gave my recommendation to the Attorney General, uh, my only objective, objective was to give her candid, honest advice, including my conclusions and my recommendations. However, I think that we have to be concerned, all of us, as I mentioned in December, about the implications of forcing the public disclosure of those memorandums, particularly at this critical time. And the implications go not only to the matters that have been cited here, the 6E materials, which of course could be redacted, the roadmap, as I've called it, which my memorandum would provide to the subjects of the investigation, but the other aspect, which is an institutional one, you cited, Mr. Chairman, I think requires a few comments by myself. In the process of investigations and prosecutions, and this is from my years as a FBI agent, but also my 10 years as a prosecutor, the business of law enforcement is continuously the preparation of memorandums. In fact, we call them pros memos in our trade, meaning prosecution memos. And innumerable times investigating both uh, sensational cases as well as routine cases, uh, prosecutors and investigators set forth in writing their reasons either for recommending prosecutions or in many cases for withholding as a discretionary basis the uh, decision to prosecute. FBI agents, assistant U.S. attorneys around the country uh, depend on that process and there is a critical institutional value in protecting the confidentiality of that process. Even under our rules of federal criminal procedure, those deliberative memorandum are not discovered, and we have probably the broadest criminal discovery of any country uh, that I've ever heard of. But those deliberative memos, to the extent that they don't include exculpatory material and Brady material, are preserved for confidentiality reasons as the work product and the deliberative product of prosecutors and attorneys. If we were to set a precedent where, an unnecessary precedent, where prosecution memos affect prosecution memos are disclosed and publicly discussed, the chilling effect that that would have on prosecutors, assistant U.S. attorneys, and investigators, in my professional judgment, would be very severe. Uh, your subpoena is not an unprecedented, unprecedented one, but it is an extraordinary one to ask for these documents in the ongoing context of a sensitive criminal investigation uh, is an extraordinary one, and I just uh, ask uh, the committee and uh, all of you to just carefully calculate the impact that this may have on many, many other cases. Also, the impact that it will have on future uh, FBI directors, perhaps, on future attorney generals. One of the attorneys who is working in the task force uh, just the other day expressed a concern about whether or not he should put into writing a recommendation that he was about to make. And his concern stemmed directly from the fact that he was unsure whether that recommendation uh, would later be discovered and subpoenaed and something that would require him to appear here today and discuss or, or explain. I just think that uh, leaving aside the constitutional arguments for a moment, and I think uh, the arguments that you make are cogent with respect to uh, privileges and the lack of a privilege, uh, perhaps uh, facilitating the litigation of such a subpoena, all of those constitutional issues notwithstanding, the practical impact this will have on, uh, I believe, uh, future FBI directors, but more importantly, line prosecutors, line agents, line investigators, I think is severe. It doesn't impact on me. This FBI director, if he had to do it all over again, uh, would write the same memorandum. Uh, but I think it is a issue that you need to consider with respect to all people in our law enforcement business. Uh, who may be uh, very, very concerned and reluctant to give their superiors the very necessary and honest and sometimes hard advice uh, that's required in our business. Um, the reason that I emphasize that is the, uh, the content, not just of these uh, documents, but other such documents. We are very concerned about protecting the, uh, the privacy, the reputation, all of the 
precious constitutional rights that inevitably are involved when we start analyzing subjects and evidence and making charging decisions or not making charging decisions. All of that information is the most sensitive information uh, that I can imagine. Forget about 6E and forget about uh, chilling prosecutors, but a lot of uh, misunderstanding could easily be uh, discerned from uh, discussions in there which sometimes rely on evidence which may not even be admissible in a court of law, but which would impact, I think, very severely on uh, privacy, due process, constitutional rights, uh, and really people's uh, reputation. So I think there's a lot really here uh, at issue. I don't think you want a uh, FBI director or an assistant U.S. attorney or a lead investigator uh, easily discussing in public uh, evidence, uh, theories of prosecution, uh, all of the things which go into the formula for writing uh, prosecution memos. So uh, again, my, my concern is institutional as you referred to it, uh, but I think it's a very strong and a very uh, fundamental one. And we ought to move very carefully before we uh, set a precedent which could come back to uh, disturb uh, all of us in many other contexts. Um, let me also say that um, my recommendation last year uh, certainly led to some speculation about a uh, rift or some type of uh, personal degreement, disagreement between the Attorney General and I, as I said in December, and as I repeat to you now, that is uh, simply not the case. I, um, uh, I have tremendous uh, respect for our Attorney General. I have tremendous affection for our Attorney General. Uh, I do not believe for one moment that any of her decisions, but particularly her decisions in this matter, have been motivated by uh, anything other than the uh, facts and the law which she is uh, obligated to follow. Uh, if I thought anything differently, I would not be sitting here today as the FBI director. I think uh, in all the matters that I have dealt with her, and this is over five years, you get to know a person pretty well, she has always brought honesty and integrity to the table. Uh, and I just wanted to make that uh, very, very clear from my point of view here this morning. It's also important to uh, repeat again that the decision on whether to appoint an independent counsel is clearly that of the Attorney General. It's not mine, it's not Mr. Labella's, it's not any of the other people who have been advising the Attorney General. That is the uh, statute which this Congress has enacted. If you wish to change that, it certainly will become the subject of hearings and discussions next year. Uh, maybe you want to make uh, co-decision makers, maybe you want to have uh, checks and balances which are not currently in the statute, but as the statute now stands, which is your statute, you give that obligation to the Attorney General of the United States. And the best that I can do, and the best that Mr. Labella can do, is to give her our honest, uh, frank uh, advice, even if that advice uh, uh, is not followed. It is her decision to make, and uh, she is now in the process of, of doing that again. Um, I've been in government now for almost 25 years. I've served under every attorney general since uh, Attorney General Levy. Um, I've done, as you've said, a number of things in the uh, public service represented by those years. Uh, I've always followed the same simple rule to investigate uh, the matters under my jurisdiction fully and fairly uh, without any favor. I let the chips fall where they may. Uh, it's not my job to be a loyal subordinate or a team player when that conflicts with my duties as FBI director. Uh, that's why you've given the FBI director a 10-year term to insulate him or her uh, a little bit more from the uh, dynamics of uh, decision making in government uh, than other public officials. I fully understand and respect, that the, uh, respect the oversight job that this committee is charged with performing. And as I said, uh, I compliment this committee, at least from uh, my perspective, on the way in which you've handled very sensitive information, uh, including briefings which were uh, dealing with classified materials. We are in a very unique situation. We have parallel investigations going on in the context of the grand jury, in the context of this committee's oversight, as well as other committees. That is a somewhat unique situation. I read your letter uh, very carefully, the cases that you cited, 
including the Supreme Court case and the Second Circuit case, uh, some of them are distinguishable. In some of those instances, there was not a pending criminal investigation. Rocky Flats and Teapot Dome were situations where the oversight uh, subpoena was exercised outside of the context of an ongoing criminal investigation. And as I said before, this is not unprecedented, but it is extraordinary. And I ask that uh, uh, you really think very, very carefully about the step that we take here because it has an impact on many things beyond this case, although this case is very important to all of us. Um, as in December, uh, both the Attorney General and I are willing to uh, work with this committee as best we can. We have offered a, a confidential briefing with respect to uh, Mr. Labella's memo. Uh, the Attorney General has only asked that that be considered uh, after she has the opportunity to make a uh, decision. We are right in the middle of her decision-making process. She has asked for a very short period of time to make a decision. I think that um, it's prudent, with all due respect, to allow the Attorney General that period of time to make a decision. I don't think anybody is prejudiced, whether it's uh, the investigation going to an independent counsel or not, or further action by this committee by waiting uh, a relatively short period of time to let her make her decision. And Mr. LaBella and I will be working during that process with her, uh, trying to persuade her uh, to do what we've recommended her to do. But I think that internal process ought to occur uh, without any external interference, at least during this very short period of time. Uh, we still have 102 FBI personnel assigned to this investigation. Uh, we have people all over the world who have been assisting in our investigation. We've conducted uh, over 3,100 interviews, and we've served more than uh, 1,900 subpoenas. Uh, this is an active investigation uh, that has not seen uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Two very, uh, one very brief period, uh, point I'd like to make before I close, and then I'm happy to ask your questions answer your questions. Uh, I just wanted to uh, publicly thank and commend uh, Chuck LaBella, who is uh, sitting next to me, for what I would consider just exemplary service uh, in the task force, uh, at great uh, sacrifice to his uh, family and also to his uh, previous obligations as the Deputy Assistant U.S. Attorney, uh, came to Washington and undertook probably one of the most difficult prosecutorial assignments uh, that I could conceive of, and I've been in this business, inside or outside of it, for about 25 years. The, uh, the vigor, the integrity, the intelligence, uh, and the force uh, by his leadership, which he brought to this investigation, uh, was really uh, a great testament to him, and I just wanted to publicly thank him uh, and his family uh, for doing just a tremendous job and putting us in, I think, a very good position uh, to conclude the matters that we have to conclude. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Free. Uh, Mr. Labella, do you have an opening statement? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Do not, do not have an opening statement. Mr. DeSarno, do you have an opening statement? I do not, Mr. Chairman. Okay, would you pull the microphones uh, close to you and we'll get into the questioning now. Uh, we will start with two 30-minute rounds and then we'll go straight to the five-minute rule for all other members. Uh, I appreciate, uh, Mr. Free, that uh, you acknowledge that our request uh, is not unprecedented. Uh, the Justice Department previously had uh, misrepresented that. Uh, that's why I submitted the nonpartisan CRS memo for the record, so I appreciate your statement regarding that. Uh, Director Free, last year, uh, November 1997 memo, recommending an independent counsel became public. In December, you testified that you recommended the appointment of an independent counsel in the campaign finance investigation, and you say that that is correct. Yes, sir. Both the mandatory as well as the discretionary. When did you first start recommending an independent counsel to the Attorney General or anyone else at the Justice Department? Um, we began discussions about the independent counsel because of the nature of this inquiry uh, at the earliest stages. So as early as um, 1997, even late 1996, uh, this was a matter of discussion within the FBI and also between myself and the Attorney General. 
So late 1996 would be a good yes, starting sir. point. What's that? Who were the discussions with, the Attorney General and, and anyone else? Uh, my discussions were uh, with the Attorney General at that time. Uh, of course, within the FBI, we had many uh, ongoing discussions among our counsel, and then there were counterpart conversations between uh, FBI agents and attorneys and Department of Justice attorneys. But you, you didn't discuss this with anyone other than the Attorney General at the Justice Department? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, when uh, you made your November 1997 recommendation, uh, it is correct, as you stated, that uh, both the mandatory and discretionary sections of the independent counsel statute had been bridged, as you yes. said that, yes. Now, under the discretionary section, if the Attorney General has a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest, then the statute may be triggered. Do you believe the Attorney General has such conflicts? Yes, sir. You want to explain that? Well, again, to explain the full nature of that conflict, I would have to, by necessity, detail a lot of the evidence, which I uh, really am reluctant to do here in this format. I would say, uh, generally, that the subject matter of the investigation, both uh, in 1997 and certainly now in 1998, involves a, a core group of individuals who, in my view, are uh, indisputably covered persons, and that the nature of that inquiry uh, it revolves around those covered persons, their associates, and uh, what I believe are potential violations of federal criminal law. I think given the, uh, the covered status, but also some of the other associated individuals in that core group, uh, there is a, a conflict which, in my judgment, can only be resolved under the statute uh, by a discretionary referral. Do you believe uh, she has conflicts with the White House? Well, again, without singling out uh, any of the covered people, uh, I believe that the core group, which is the subject of this investigation, uh, includes uh, both covered people where the statute would uh, require a referral, but also people who, because of their association with covered people, would also, uh, on a discretionary basis, trigger the referral. So the answer to that is yes, I presume. Well, the question yes, was, in a much larger context than the White House. In a larger context than the White House? Yes, sir. What's that? Uh, I don't know if you're going to want to answer this, but does that include the President and the Vice President? Yes, sir. Now, the mandatory section is triggered when there is specific evidence from a credible source on a covered person. So in your investigation, did you find that there was sufficient evidence on a covered person to trigger the mandatory operation of the statute? And I think you've already answered that. Uh, the Attorney General, of course, when you told her these things, she did, she, she did not take your advice. Did you talk to her directly when you submitted your report? We've had many conversations, yes, sir, including when we gave her the report. When you gave her the report, how long was it before she uh, uh, declined to take your advice? I believe it was several weeks. You don't, can't be more specific than that? I'd have to go and, and check my dates. Was it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? It was two weeks. A couple of weeks? A couple of weeks, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. But just, you know, to be clear, we've had discussions of this now for, for a very long period of time, and the contents of that memo were clearly and in many cases repeatedly discussed between her and I, so she had a long time to consider those arguments. Uh, Director Free, didn't uh, part of your memo address the fact that the Attorney General appears to be inconsistent in applying the independent counsel statute in comparison to other cases where she has invoked it, such as uh, Whitewater? In the memorandum, I cited uh, precedents and compared them with the current uh, state of facts. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Labella, uh, you were asked to come on board and head up the task force last fall. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've been a prosecutor for over 15 years. That's correct. And during that time, you served as an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, chief of the general crimes unit, chief of the public corruption unit, 
chief of the general crimes unit, chief of the organized crimes unit, chief of the narcotics unit, senior trial counsel, chief of the criminal division, and first assistant U.S. attorney. I can't keep a job. You can't keep a job, okay. And then from October 1997 until just recently, you served as supervising attorney to the campaign financing task force. That's right. And in June 1998, you were asked to serve as acting U.S. attorney in San Diego, where you now serve. That's correct. That's quite an illustrious background, Mr. LaBella, and I'd like to compliment you on your obvious credentials and dedicated public service. It's an impressive record. And I know my colleagues and staff thought very highly of you uh, while you served in what had to be a difficult situation given the reported division at the department on these issues. Uh, Mr. LaBella, did you concur with Director Free's recommendations last November 1997 for an independent counsel? I made my own recommendation uh, in a report to the Attorney General um, dated July 16th of this year. Did, um, with respect to um, uh, the events that occurred um, last year, I believe um, when, I was, when I was asked my opinion by the Attorney General, I gave my candid, unvarnished opinion uh, in December when, when a decision was being made. Um, I did not review uh, Ms. the director's uh, memo um, at that time, nor was I asked for an opinion on it. Did you tell her you thought there should be an independent counsel at that time? In December of last year? Yeah. Yes. You did. Okay, and, and now, uh, Mr. Lobella, your memo to the Attorney General, which is over 100 pages long and has 55 exhibits, is it true that in your memo you expressed your strong support for an independent counsel? My recommendation um, was that um, it's appropriate to appoint an independent counsel at this time. When did you submit the, that memo to the Attorney General? Do you know the exact date? It's, it's dated um, July 16th. I, I believe I gave it to her that evening, about 7, 7.30 that evening. And uh, do you make this recommendation based on both the mandatory and discretionary sections of the statute? I made the recommendation based on uh, every uh, fact and issue and, and, and um, legal argument that was fairly presented to me in the context of my job as the, the supervising attorney of the task force. I'm really reluctant to go into the analysis per se, but what I, what I did recommend was um, the recommendation I've given was based on the facts and the law as I saw them. Now, under the uh, discretionary section, if the Attorney General has a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest in the statute may be triggered. Do you believe the Attorney General has such conflicts? I don't believe um, that I've... I, I really, my recommendations to the Attorney, the specific recommendations to the Attorney General that I made in my report, um, I believe, uh, need to be remain confidential. I've recommended to her I've given her my best analysis, my best, um, my best judgment on all the facts and the law that have been fairly presented during the course of our investigation, and that, that's what I've done. So you don't want to go into the details I'd of really, what was mandatory? I'd really, I would really not like to go into the details of the advice that I gave to the Attorney General because I think that it would, it would impede, it could impede um, ongoing investigations. Not only could it impede ongoing investigations, but it could disclose grand jury materials. My well, advice, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Mr. Labella. I, w w we certainly don't want to uh, venture into the grand jury or 6C testimony or, or, or give anybody a hint of where the, the investigation should go. All I'm asking you is, uh, do you believe that the dic discretionary part uh, uh, did, did, you, did, you, did you believe that the Attorney General had a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest the, in the, the discretionary? discretionary the discretionary clause of the, uh, the Independent Counsel Act played a very small part in my memorandum and recommendation to the Attorney General. Okay, now, uh, the mandatory section is triggered when there is specific information from a credible source about a covered person. So in your investigation, did you find that there was sufficient information on a covered person to trigger the mandatory part of the statute? And you don't need to be specific about who it would be. Right. My recommendation um, was that an independent counsel should be appointed at this time, and it was appropriate to do so at this time. So, so you're saying the mandatory was triggered as well? That's the, that's the clause that I, I uh, is the, is the, is the um, 
major clause in which is analyzed in my, in my report to the Attorney General. Director Free, uh, you and Mr. Labella came to these conclusions independently from each other, isn't that correct? Yes, we did. Uh, Mr. DeSarno, uh, you're the lead investigator in this matter, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Do you concur with the recommendations of Director <coughs> Free and Mr. Labella? I do, yes, sir. And Director Free, uh, do you believe the Attorney General is applying the law correctly uh, to the facts in this case? I think she's made a uh, decision under the statute which the Congress has charged her to make, which only she can make, and I certainly uh, respect that decision. I've recommended a different outcome, obviously, but I think she has properly exercised her authority and followed the statute because the statute requires her to make the decision. I know the statute requires her to make the decision, and I, 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 I reluctantly uh, press this issue, but do you believe she's applying the law correctly in this case? Again, I think, uh, I think my recommendation represents that we view the law differently, and I come out one way and she comes out the other way, but it's her way that counts uh, because that's the authority you've given her. You're a real diplomat. Don't run against me, will you not? Mr. Labella, do you believe the Attorney General is applying the law correctly to the facts in the case? I made my recommendation to the Attorney General based on the facts and the law that I knew um, and as I know them. I gave her my best judgment. It's for her to decide. Um, I, it's not for me to conclude whether she's right or wrong. It's for me to advise her what I think as a career prosecutor. I've done that. I've given my, my level best uh, judgment and uh, it's for her to decide. Are there like the any facts, decision. this is for both of you, are there any facts to your knowledge that uh, she might know that you don't? I don't believe so. I don't think so. Mr. Labella, uh, reports indicate that you concluded that the Attorney General has uh, misinterpreted the law creating an artificially high standard to avoid invoking the independent counsel statute. I don't know if these were your exact words, but did you indicate something to that effect in your memo? I gave the Attorney General my frank, candid, unvarnished view of what the law is and how it should be applied, and I commented on the process that we have had underway in the department since I've been here since September, and you know I made my recommendation to her in that regard. I understand, but did you say anything to the effect in your recommendations to her that she was setting an artificially high standard to avoid invoking the independent counsel statute. I don't believe I used anything to that effect. I, again, the way, I, the way my report reads is I analyze the law, I analyze the facts, this is where I come out, this is, the, this is the threshold that I think we should be applying, and that's my best judgment. I never said in my memo that I think you're wrong. I didn't, I didn't do that. Well, I wouldn't do that if it was my boss either, I don't think. I think I'd be a little more diplomatic. I have enough people mad at me, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> And again, Mr. Labella, the Washington Post from this past report, this past Sunday reports that, and I quote, the report advises Reno that she must seek an independent counsel if she herself is going to obey the law according to officials familiar with the document. Again, not being exact and getting away from these exact words, did you indicate something to that effect in your memo? It's my judgment, my best judgment, um, based on the facts of the law that I know them, concerning my tenure with the task force that I think it's appropriate at this time to appoint an independent counsel. Mr. Uh, Labella, uh, the Washington Post on July 24th uh, said uh, that your report included an extensive review of the evidence and makes a firmer conclusion that there are sufficient indications of wrongdoing by top officials to oblige Reno to seek an outside prosecutor uh, and that these officials included top Democratic and White House officials. Is that correct? I don't want to go into the, the, the particulars of, of my report in that I believe to do so as a career prosecutor, I'm telling you, I think it would be, it would be detrimental to the ongoing investigations. Okay. We won't press you on that. And isn't it true that your report also indicates, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but uh, we'd like to if, if you can. And isn't it true that your report also indicates that you believe both Democrat and Republican fundraising should be part of any independent council? 
again, I, I really don't want to go into the particulars okay. of my recommendation to the AG. Mr. Lavella, yesterday's Wall Street Journal reported that your memo focused sharply on the fundraising efforts of Harold Ickes, the former Deputy White House Chief of Staff. They formed the basis of Mr. Lavella's recommendation that Ms. Reno seek the appointment of an independent counsel. Is, is, is that accurate? I think I know the answer to you. The, the answer is, predictably, I don't want to go into the particulars of, uh, of, of my recommendation to okay. the Attorney General. Do you consider the Attorney General to have a political conflict in an investigation of Harold Ickes? You're asking for my personal opinion? Yes. I, you know, that's a decision she has to make. I, I, can't, I can't make that decision. Are you aware of any particular individuals which the Attorney General thought would require her to trigger the discretionary section of the Independent Council, sta council Statute if they were part of this investigation? I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that again? Yeah, that's not a very clear question. Are you aware of any particular individuals which the Attorney General thought would require her to trigger the discretionary section of the Independent Council Statute if they were part of this investigation? I don't think she's ever made that known to me, which individuals, if any, would trigger the discretionary clause. Definitively. Mr. Labella, did you have an opportunity to speak with the Attorney General about your memo and discuss the recommendations in detail? Uh, not since I gave her the memo on July 16th. I have not. So, so, so you haven't had a chance to talk to her after you gave her the memo? We have not spoken about the memo. So you just gave her the memo and you haven't gone through it bit by bit with her? No. Has she called you to talk to you about it? Uh, no, she's reviewing it, and I assume that when she's finished reviewing it, um, we'll discuss it. But no, I haven't spoken to her about it yet. Hmm. Uh, Director Free, you reportedly stated in your memo, it is difficult to imagine a more compelling situation for appointing an independent counsel. Is that accurate? I certainly recommended that under the discretionary clause, uh, my best judgment based on everything that I know about the case uh, was a, I couldn't think of a stronger argument for a independent counsel. And that was almost nine months ago. Do you think the case is any less compelling today than it was then? No, sir. Is it more compelling now? I think that's a, that's a, a judgment that I don't think I could describe that without going into other matters and other areas. It's, it's as, certainly as compelling now as it was when I made the recommendation. But you don't want to elaborate on whether it was more, it's more compelling because more evidence has come forth? Yeah, I'd rather not. Okay. Have you reviewed uh, Mr. Labella's memo? Yes, sir. And you've already finished your review? Yes, sir. How long did it take you to uh, come to conclusions on his uh, report? <coughs> Well, I've read it over several times. I've spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at it and the exhibits um, over the last uh, several weeks. So how long did it take you to come to your conclusions that uh, his memo was accurate or, or you agreed with it? Well, um, I do agree with it. Um, I think it was the process of the last uh, couple of weeks reading it. So it took you a couple of weeks to come to that conclusion? That well, to read it fully so I could support a conclusion like that. Yes, sir. Two weeks, okay. Would it be fair to uh, say that you agree with his conclusions? I do. And would it be fair to say that he makes a very compelling case for an independent counsel uh, given the facts to date? I agree with his recommendations. Uh, has the Attorney General, Mr. Free, discussed Mr. Labella's memo with you? Uh, no, sir. Do you intend to share your views with the Attorney General uh, regarding the memo? I do if I'm asked for them, yes, sir. Do you, either one of you know if she's talked to anybody else at the Justice Department about this memo? Um, she has told me that she was discussing it with, uh, with her uh, staff, but I don't know in particular who. Do either one of you know whom she's talking to over there? No, sir, I don't Ms. know. Mr. Labella? I mean, I, I know that copies of my memorandum, I only made three copies, one for me, one for the director, and one for the Attorney General. I know that copies have been distributed I think at least nine copies to people in the Department of Justice. Uh, I know that. Are, are, are those people political appointees, any of them? Like, like Lee, let's see, we have Lee Radick and who's the other? Bob Litt. Are Lee Radick and Bob Litt two of the people that are looking at that? I have only heard, no one has told me definitively, I've only heard um, secondhand who the people were. Um, 
Mr. Radick is not a political appointee, but I think he has a copy of it. And how about Mr. Litt? Um, I believe his name was mentioned, too. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is there anybody else that you could tell us uh, who uh, has been privy to your memo, sir? Not that I've only heard. I don't know. No one has discussed the memo with me. I understand, but, but uh, you, you, I'm sure, conversant with whom is looking at your memo, and I'd just like to know who they are. Well, you don't have to give us I any believe, details. You know, I believe Mark Richard probably has a copy. I believe uh, Mr. Robinson probably has a copy. Uh, I believe Eric Holder probably has a copy. Do you know uh, Mr. Litt? Mr. Litt has a copy? I understand that he does. And uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Radick. Uh, Mr. Radick. Ms. Farrington. Ms. Farrington. Um, those are the names that I were given that I can recall right now. And Mr. Holder. And Mr. Holder. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Uh, Who, who uh, Mr. Labella, uh, is, is involved in the Attorney General's decision-making? In the New York Times report of July 23rd discussing your memo, uh, they said the Attorney General assembled several of her top advisors to discuss the report on Tuesday. And were you included in that meeting? When was that? The, that was on Tuesday, July 21st. I was, I was not in Washington. I was in San Diego. No, I didn't discuss it with her. Was Mr. Free included in that meeting? No, I was not. Was Mr. DeSarno included in that meeting? I was not. Okay, now I want to make sure I've got this clear. Uh, she assembled uh, her top advisors, and yet the three people closest to the investigation were not involved in the meeting to discuss your decision and your report, Mr. LaBella? I believe I was in San Diego at the time. You were in uh, San Diego. Was, you were not, not here. consulted, Mr. Free? I was not at the meeting. But was that? I was not at the meeting, no. And you were not? I was not. And you weren't invited either? None of you. Okay. Do you know who was in the meeting? Have you been told of who's in the meeting? No. I don't None know. of you were? No. No, sir. Have there been other meetings about your memo that you know of besides that one? Not that I'm aware of. Did you know of that meeting? No, I don't think I knew about that meeting, no. I, I knew there was one meeting where the, the report had been handed out. That's the only meeting that I was ever told discussing my report. But you don't know of the meeting of July 21st when no. they were discussing it in some detail? And you don't know who was at the meeting other than just hearing about this? Okay. Director Free, uh, you weren't included in the meeting. Uh, do you have any idea who was at that meeting? No, sir, I don't. Okay. Do either you or Mr. LaBella, uh, you, do either you, Mr. LaBella, or Director Free know if David uh, Vins, how do you pronounce his Sinanzo. name? Vincenzo. Vincenzo. Well, why can't they get Smith up there or something? Is it? <laughs> it's it's, well, it's well, tough well, to get Smith to work for the Department of Justice. What's that? It's tough to get Smiths to work for the Department of Justice. But um, <laughs> okay. Dave, David Vincenzo, he's the head of the task force. I understand. He replaced he's me. He's the new head of the task force replacing you. Uh, do you know if uh, he was included in that meeting? I do not know. You do not. Mr. DeSarno. Uh, were you included in this or any meetings to discuss Mr. LaBella's memo? I think you've already said no. No, I was not, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Are any of you aware of significant meetings uh, involving discussion of the memo to which you were not invited, other than what when we're talking about? No, I don't. Okay. No, no, no. Mr. LaBella, did you discuss your memo with the current head of the task force, the new gentleman? Dave Vincenzo. Uh, yeah. We've discussed it generally, yes. Have you gone into detail with, with, with him about it? We've gone into detail on certain aspects of it because it involves ongoing investigations, and I'm, I'm keeping abreast of the ongoing investigations with respect to which I am played, played some, some role. Does so he I'm, support your position? I haven't asked him, and he hasn't told me. I mean, I, I don't know. To your knowledge, has the general, uh, Attorney General asked his views on the issue? No, I... I, I don't know if she has asked his views on the report. I don't know that. Has she talked to him about the report, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge she could have. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mr. LaBella, are you aware uh, to whom the Attorney General has disseminated your report? I think you've already answered that question. We have that. Uh, were you aware of opposition to the appointment of an independent counsel for Mr. Radick, head of the Public Integrity Section? I haven't discussed um, these issues with Mr. Radick. 
Well, were you aware that he was opposed to the appointment of an independent counsel? I know what I've read in the papers, but I, I really haven't discussed it with Mr. Radick. Okay. Director Free, were you aware of whether Mr. Radick opposed uh, an independent counsel? At what point in time? Well, let's go six months ago, three months ago, and today. Well, there's been a lot of independent counsel issues over the period. Well, I'm talking of about this independent counsel regarding the the the, uh, the, the campaign finance investigation. Um, I have heard, but not directly from him, because I have not discussed it with him. But I have heard that uh, he has recommended against it. And would you both agree that Mr. Radick has an important say on these matters? He has the ear of the Attorney General. He, of course, he's the, um, the chief of the section and the section that's responsible for reviewing matters relating to independent counsel referral. Mr. Labella? I'm sure it's someone the Attorney General consults. Mr. Labella and Director Free, isn't it well known that a key political advisor to the Attorney General, Bob Litt, is opposed to an independent counsel? Either one of you? Well, again, I have not had any discussions with Mr. Litt about um, his recommendations, uh, whether I, I know he's consulted with the Attorney General, but I'm not privy to those conversations. I understand, but uh, you, you are very close to this investigation. Have you been told or heard in any way that Mr. Litt is opposed mm -hmm. to an independent counsel? Um, I have heard that on different issues, and of course there are many, many different issues involving independent counsel that uh, in some instances uh, he has expressed, uh, not to me, but to others, uh, uh, concerns about uh, applying the statute. Mr. Bella, It's not a subject that uh, he and I have discussed. Have you heard anything about that from any other source, that Mr. Litt was opposed to the appointment of an independent counsel? Any other source? I, I don't believe so. I, I don't... It's not a subject that we've discussed, and I can't right now recall anybody telling me that he's opposed to the, the appointment of a particular independent counsel. Okay. And Mr. LaBelle and Director Free, isn't it uh, well known that, uh, that... I think we've covered that, yeah. Okay. Uh, Director Free and Mr. LaBelle, the committee and D DOJ have received copies of 200 $1,000 traveler's checks which were purchased in Jakarta, Indonesia, and distributed in the United States by Charlie Tree and an ex-LIPO executive, Antonio Pan. Are you familiar with those checks? Yes, I am. You are. We've been familiar for some What's time. That? We've been familiar with for some time about those checks. Okay. A number of Charlie Tree Associates received this money and used it for conduit contributions to the DNC. From our investigation, it appears that many of these checks were used for conduit payments to the DNC. We have learned that uh, money such as this has not been returned by the DNC. Isn't the fact that the DNC is potentially financially impacted by this investigation part of the conflicts problem that the Attorney General has in investigating these serious financial allegations of wrongdoing of high officials in her own party? Mr. LaBella? Did those you? matters relate to ongoing investigations, and, and those are not matters I'm permitted by law to discuss. I understand, and I'm not asking for you to, to, to comment uh, other than uh, these people are in the, the, the DNC, high officials in the DNC, and uh, 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 isn't there a conflict there between the, the Attorney General investigating those people? Again, it would be impossible for me to answer that question without jeopardizing ongoing investigative work that the task force is currently doing. Mr. Free. Mr. Chairman, with respect to specific questions of conflict, uh, as you have specifying individuals and relating them to the facts of the case, I, I just feel very uncomfortable talking about that. I think well, just, it gets just, I'm, I'm finishing up now. Just generally regarding the DNC, no specific individuals, wouldn't this be a conflict? Not just on those facts. I think you need a lot of other. Uh, facts to make that conclusion. I think just that fact alone would not necessarily be a conflict. And you're not able to discuss it any further than that? Not without going into facts, which I don't think I should. Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Free, in your experience over the years, is it unprecedented to find different advisors giving different advice to an attorney general? 
Not at all. I would hope and expect that attorney generals, past, present, and future always receive uh, different uh, good advice. And I think the more divergent it is at times, the better it is for that attorney general to make what uh, he or she thinks is the best decision. There, there can be legitimate differences about the, the law and how it applies uh, without it being wrongdoing to come to a different conclusion than yes, sir. from one person as, to, as opposed to another. I mean, the Supreme Court of the United States has handed down a lot of five to four decisions, which indicates that they have different uh, conclusions about the facts and the law when the matters are presented to them. In this committee, we had a chief counsel quit because he didn't think the chairman was following his recommendations. We all have staff people who give us different recommendations. Um, and we know on this committee as well that different staff people claim to have had different views they presented to the chairman regarding the handling of the Hubble tapes. So we're not talking about something unprecedented to have views expressed that, that are different from different advisors. Is that accurate? That's correct. Mr. Be Labella, you don't disagree with that, do you? Uh, no. No. Uh, Mr. Free, uh, I understand the Attorney General has consulted not just with Mr. Burton about the Labella memo, but also with Senator Hatch, the Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and uh, Mr. Hyde, the Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. I further understand that these chairmen are taking a very different approach to the Labella memorandum than Chairman Burton. Can you describe the approach that Senator Hatch is taking and compare it to the approach that our chairman is taking? Mr. Roxman, the only thing I know about that is the clip that I saw when I was waiting in the, in the witness room. I've not spoken to uh, Senator Hatch or Mr. Hyde or the Attorney General about what their position is. Well, Senator Hatch is going along with the Attorney General and giving her three weeks before she'll come in and have to talk about the memo and her decision, but giving her a chance to review that memorandum. Uh, is, is that action more consistent with the Department of Justice precedents, to, to your knowledge, than what we have here in this committee? Well, I'm not familiar with all the precedents. It's certainly consistent with my recommendation, as I expressed uh, before. I think uh, it's reasonable and prudent to give the Attorney General three weeks to make a decision uh, before anything uh, is done. I don't think anybody or anybody is uh, prejudiced by that. That's certainly my position. And that position that you have, which you articulated to the chairman in the meeting we had last Friday and which you've expressed today, is not just based on the fairness to the attorney general, which is not insignificant, but it's not just based on that. It's based on uh, doing the least amount of harm to the de department's ongoing criminal investigation. Yeah, it's, it's that, and it's also the institutional concerns I expressed. I think if we can, uh, all of us in this room, avoid a situation where the uh, two branches uh, confront each other over this issue and the fallout that that has on other prosecutors and investigators, I think if we can avoid that, it's prudent to do so. Mr. Free, uh, it's well known that you've recommended to the Attorney General that you appoint an independent counsel to investigate democratic violations. Do you believe that an independent counsel should be appointed to investigate Republican violations? I think by necessity the uh, jurisdiction would uh, include uh, all campaign uh, financing activity and it would be a universal inquiry. Let me make sure that I understand this uh, statement because it's the first time that I've heard it. But it's your view that if there's going to be an independent counsel, the independent counsel ought to be looking at Democratic and Republican campaign violations? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the uh, jurisdiction of an independent counsel would have to be defined not only by the court, if a court were to appoint one, but that jurisdiction would also be a function of what recommendation the Attorney General uh, makes and um, whether it uh, denominates into uh, parties or subgroupings or whatever, uh, I think that uh, jurisdiction would be a very broad and wide-ranging jurisdiction. Um, have you articulated this point of view, made this recommendation to the Attorney General? Discuss that in my memorandum. Mr. Labella, do you agree with Director Free on this point? I do. Yeah.
Is it uh, based on a conflict of interest uh, idea that would lead you to that conclusion that the Attorney General um, ought to appoint an independent investigator when it comes to uh, Republican potential abuses of campaign finance laws? Well, again, I haven't denominated in terms of uh, Democratic or Republican. I would certainly agree with the uh, proposition that a conflict, if one were to be found to exist, uh, could uh, run uh, despite whether it's a, a Democratic or Republican uh, subject. In fact, the uh, 1994 expansion of the Independent Counsel Act, uh, as you know, for the first time allowed the Attorney General the discretion to include uh, members of Congress in terms of discretionary referral under the Independent Counsel Act. So I think it goes beyond any particular denomination. Director Free, one of the areas that the press has reported that the Justice Department is investigating is the issue advertising practices of both Democratic and Republican parties. This is the, the practice of using soft money to pay for so-called issue ads that are really no more than thinly disguised campaign commercials. Do you think that an independent counsel should investigate the use of such ads by the Democrats? Well, again, I think if I, if I answer that question, I have to necessarily uh, either detail or reflect by my answer, you know, very detailed and specific parts of my uh, memorandum. I will say that the subject matter of uh, advocacy ads and issue ads uh, was certainly a part of my memorandum, but I think to go beyond that, I'd have to start going into details which uh, I prefer not to. If one were to come to the conclusion that there ought to be an independent counsel investigating issue ads uh, paid for by the soft money uh, contributions, do you think that uh, an independent counsel should look at Republican as well as Democratic practices in this area? I, I think that's... Distinguish one from the other? I think that's too difficult a question to answer because the referral and the jurisdiction established by the court has to predicate itself on particular facts and I don't think hypothetically you could you could make that leap. Well if one were to find the practice of using soft money for issue ads as a violation potential violation of the law and to which there ought to be an investigation I would presume that if that topic is a subject to an investigation it wouldn't be as it relates only to one party if both parties were doing the same thing. Yeah, on those facts, I think you're correct. Press accounts say that the FBI is investigating evidence that Haley Barber and the Republican National Committee knowingly solicited foreign money contributions. For example, the Senate hearings revealed that the National Policy Forum, which is a subsidiary of the RNC, received hundreds of thousands of dollars from a Hong Kong businessman by the name of Ambrose Young, you think these allegations should be investigated by an independent uh, counsel? I think that uh, I think the matters that you refer to are uh, too current with respect to matters uh, uh, being reviewed. Many, many matters, but uh, I think. I, I really can't comment on that. I think you're asking me to, uh, first of all, speculate, but also discuss aspects of the grand jury investigation that would not be proper for me to do. Mr. Labella, do you have any uh, views on this matter that you... Uh, no. Uh, another Republican organization which has received scrutiny from the press and the Senate committee is the Triad Management. Triad is a corporation that secretly funneled campaign contributions to Republican campaigns across the country. Triad also coordinated with Republican campaigns to run anonymous issue advertisements against Democratic candidates. In fact, many members of this committee have been linked to Triad's activities. Uh, do you believe that the activities of Triad management should be investigated by an independent counsel, Mr. Labella? really wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on anything that's ongoing with respect to the task force's work. Um, I believe once we get into that 
aspect, we go down that slippery slope, and there's nowhere to stop. I just we have to draw the line on on talking about specific uh, allegations and specific investigations which are which are active in front of the task force. I respect that, but is it fair to say that in your recommendations to the attorney general that an independent counsel be appointed to look at campaign finance abuses? that uh, you were not just looking at campaign finance abuses by Democrats, you were looking at campaign finance abuses, broadly speaking, by both or either party? Let me take a, a stab at answering the question as best I can. If, if I were an independent counsel, if I were receiving this matter as an independent counsel, I would want to look at everything because I think in order to investigate properly um, one allegation of wrongdoing, I think you have to fundamentally understand the fabric of campaign financing um, as, as it is, as it exists, in order to make a determination which anyone will have to do, whether it's a Department of Justice prosecutor or an independent counsel someday in his or her, the exercise of his or her prosecutorial discretion, um, even if, assuming you get to the point where there is probable cause to believe a crime has com been committed and a particular person committed the crime, whether or not it's appropriate to bring an indictment uh, on that on that evidence because of other factors that we we as prosecutors consider all the time I, I hope that answers your question so you think if there's going to be an investigation that an independent counsel would have to look at a broader perspective of campaign finance abuses and not to be restricted to one part or the other uh, irrespective of whether that independent counsel later reaches a conclusion that indictments ought to be brought if it were me that's the way I would handle it I would want to look as much as I I'd look at as much as I could possibly look at so I could make informed decisions at the end of the day yes director free do you think that uh, makes sense it, it makes sense but again the the authority of the independent counsel subject to expansion by the court is fairly well circumscribed so it would depend on what authority the court decides to establish and then modify well that would be based on what the attorney general would recommend the attorney general would recommend that an independent counsel be appointed and she would then delineate what she thought ought to be investigated yes, by an independent. and the courts as i recall have always gone along with the attorney general's recommendation they generally do but the court can modify that and even modify it um, uh, against the recommendation of an attorney general but th that's never happened um, I'm, I'm not so sure that has not happened. I see. Um, I understand the department has an ongoing investigation into allegations. Uh, uh, well, you don't want to get into any specific allegations, and I'll respect that. Uh, a great deal of uh, symbolic value has been placed on the question of whether an independent counsel should be appointed. People talk about it uh, as if appointing an independent counsel were an end in and of itself. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you were in the room, that I myself had called for an independent counsel over a year and a half ago. I did that in, in an op-ed in the New York Times. Um, but I, I don't think the most important question is whether or not an independent counsel is appointed. I think the most important question is whether these allegations are being investigated thoroughly and professionally. That's my dispute with our chairman, because his view of running this committee is to do an investigation that's only one-sided, that's partisan, that won't look at abuses by Republicans and will look for any potential abuses, <coughs> real or imagined, relating to Democrats. It's not only partisan, it's also been unprofessional, I believe. Director Free and Mr. Labella, for the last year and a half, you have run the campaign finance investigation. Uh, I want to ask you a series of questions about your efforts. I want to learn whether your efforts have been thorough, whether they have been professional, whether they, ha whether they have differed in any way from what you would expect an independent counsel to do. I, I understand the Department of Justice Campaign Finance Task Force is the largest open criminal investigation employing over a hundred individuals including Department of Justice attorneys, FBI agents, and support staff. Do you believe that the task force is adequately staffed to conduct an investigation of this nature, Director Free? Yes, sir. And Mr. Labella? Yes, I do. Sarno? Do yes, you? sir, I do. Do you believe that Department of Justice attorneys and FBI agents currently working on the investigation are competent and professional? 
Yes, I do. Mr. Labella? Yes, sir. Mr. Desarno? Absolutely, sir. Do you think that an independent council would be able to put together a more competent staff than you and Mr. Labella have assembled? No. Labella? I don't think so. Mr. Desarno? No, sir. I understand from your testimony that you've issued nearly 2,000 subpoenas in connection with the campaign finance investigation. At any point, did the Attorney General or the White House interfere in any way with the issuance of any subpoena that you thought was important to the investigation, Director Free? No. No, sir. No. No, sir. Can you think of any subpoena that would be issued by an independent counsel that wasn't issued by the task force? Well, if, there, if the independent counsel's jurisdiction was, was different or... Uh, well, it may be more narrow, but it wouldn't be as broad as yours. Isn't that fair? It would depend what the court established. Uh, so, I mean, hypothetically, they could be issuing different subpoenas because they could be along jurisdictional lines that are different from us. But, but you're conducting an investigation on campaign finance abuses. And can you think of any subpoena that you should have been issuing if you were an independent counsel doing the same job that you haven't issued? Well, again, hypothetically, because of the distinction between uh, covered and non-covered individuals, a independent counsel who would then be focused on uh, people who were determined to be covered uh, might have a different expanse than we would have in determining whether somebody was covered or not because of the preliminary investigation that doesn't permit subpoena power. Uh, but it, uh, I'm, to answer your question, I'm confident that uh, with respect to all the matters that I'm charged with supervising, and Mr. Labella can speak for himself, we have uh, vigorously uh, pursued by subpoena interview and many other techniques uh, the investigation that we feel is necessary. Do, uh, what about interviewing witnesses? At any point were you prohibited in any way by the Attorney General or the White House from interviewing any witness you thought was important to the investigation? Certainly not by the White House. There were uh, discussions and at times disagreements about the timing of interviews between the agents and the prosecutors, uh, which by the way occurs uh, in many investigations. Uh, but we were never, uh, to my knowledge, prohibited from conducting an interview at some point that we thought was critical. Mr. Labella, do you agree with that? Yes. Mr. DeSarno? I agree, yes, sir. So at this point in the investigation, there are no witness interviews that you believe would be conducted by an independent counsel that you haven't already conducted? Well, you know, uh, no, with the proviso, again, that an independent counsel would exercise jurisdiction in a different way than we would. And again, Possibly. And I assume the same answer about any powers an independent counsel would have that you don't have. No. Are, are there any? No, none that I know of. I assume the answer is the same for, for all of you. The task force has now indicted or convicted 11 individuals on charges stemming from the campaign finance inquiry. Are there any indictments that an independent counsel would have sought that the task force did not pursue? I don't think I could answer that question. It, it, that's a hard question to answer. There are a lot of prosecutors out there. I'm dare to say that there's some better than me, and uh, they may have come up with a better way to do it. But we've done the best we can. Has the Attorney General, Mr. Labella, or the White House prevented the task force from indicting any individuals or entities that you felt deserved to be indicted? I've never had any contact with the White House concerning ongoing investigations. My, my contact with the Department has been um, through the chain of command up into including the Attorney General, and never have we been prevented from bringing any charges or seeking any indictments. There have been lively debates about the way indictments should be formed, uh, who should be included, um, whether additional charges um, should be brought, and, and at times we have declined to bring cases after a lively debate, but it's always the normal process that any prosecutor, team of prosecutors and investigators go through. Let, let me just ask it this way. Have any of you ever been told to pull a punch because of uh, politics? No. No. Absolutely not. So it's fair to say in substance that you've conducted the campaign finance investigation in the same way that you would expect an independent counsel to conduct the investigation. Is that accurate? Yes. I've conducted it the only way I know how. 
So I, I don't know how an independent counsel would do it. I want to come back uh, one last time to the question of the scope of your recommendations for an independent counsel. You both have recommended an independent counsel. Everyone naturally assumes that your recommendation is focused on democratic violations. But I understand from my question and your answers that your recommendation to appoint an independent counsel does not break down along party lines. In other words, the activities that you believe the independent counsel should investigate include the activities of both Democrats and Republicans. Is that right, Mr. Labella? I'll start with you. We investigate every allegation that we get. Um, we don't analyze what side of, of, of the fence the investigation is on. We just follow the leads where they take us and we pursue every lead. Um, I can't tell you which investigations we have ongoing now, but if an allegation comes to us and it, it's sufficient to trigger an investigation, we will trigger an investigation. I'm asking about your referral recommendation that there be an independent counsel. Is it fair that in that recommendation the independent counsel uh, uh, not, not be Look, uh, pursuing matters uh, along party lines exclusively? My recommendation relates specifically to matters that are before the task force. So with respect to those matters, I have recommended that an independent counsel be appointed. And Mr. F Director Freed, you, can you tell me your views on that? Uh, my recommendation didn't break down along uh, any party lines. I made a very broad-based uh, recommendation which would be a very inclusive uh, referral, and it didn't denominate or break down or uh, subscribe to or even relate to one, uh, one party or the other. It was a subject matter referral. Subject matter. Your recommendation for an independent counsel, Director Free, is because you believe the law requires it. It's not because you don't think that a thorough investigation is not being conducted. Is that, a, is that an accurate statement? That's an accurate statement. I believe a, a thorough investigation is being conducted within the parameters uh, that we're operating under. And if the law requires an independent counsel take over this investigation, you believe that independent counsel ought to pursue campaign finance issues within his or her jurisdiction pertaining both to Democrats and Republicans? I think that independent counsel ought to pursue the jurisdiction established by the court and ought to come back to the court and the attorney general uh, at any predicate uh, point where he or she believes it should change or expand. Well, in the initial recommendation for the appointment of an independent counsel, are you recommending an independent counsel to investigate matters that uh, relate to the subject matter of the violation, whether they be ha have been uh, violated by Democrats or Republicans? It, it's a it's an impossible question to answer because the recommendation did not break down along those uh, bright line parameters. It's a recommendation which I think is, is uh, based on the facts, certainly as we've developed them, but it, it doesn't subscribe to or delineate uh, uh, a description or characterization by, uh, by, by political party. Well, if I still have time, I want to yield to um, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Lantos. May I ask how much time do we have, Mr. Chairman? <clears throat> Following your rejection, Mr. Chairman, of the Attorney General's request to appear at this hearing, she sent a letter to you and copies were distributed to other members of the committee. And I, like, I ask unanimous consent to insert her letter into the record. Reserving the right to object. Gentlemen. If the gentleman reserves the right to object, I will not ask uh, for I simply this. want to know. I, I withdraw not... my request and I will read the letter. I simply would like to get a dear, copy of the letter. Mr. Dear Chairman, Mr. On my Chairman. Right to, may I be heard on my right to object? The, 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 the gentleman, I withdraw my request. Well, but the gentleman, and I reclaim my time. Can I be heard on my right to object? The, the, the gentleman has a reservation. I, I think uh, we have to wait until he states his reservation. Then you can With a withdraw. copy of the letter in my hand, I withdraw my, right, my reservation of the problem, right to object. Point of order. If there's a unanimous consent request pending, there can be a reservation, just, but if it's withdrawn... If the general will suspend, I'll check with the parliamentarian real quickly. Dear Mr. Chairman, after reviewing your letter of August 3... The gentleman will suspend just one moment.
Our parliamentarian said that uh, before you can read the letter, Mr. Shetty has to state his reservation. Then you can withdraw it if you choose. Mr. Shetty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I simply wanted a copy of the letter. I have now gotten one. I withdraw my uh, reservation. Gen the gentleman withdraws his reservation. Gentlemen. <clears throat> this is a letter from the Attorney General to you, Mr. Burton. Which dear I Mr. have not yet read. This, dear Mr. I'll help you read it. Dear Mr. Chairman, after reviewing your letter of August 3 and the press statements by members of your staff over the weekend, it is clear that the committee's primary focus is my decision making on the question of the appointment of an independent counsel. That is why I called you this morning and requested an opportunity to be heard at the committee's hearing. In light of your rejection of my request to be heard, let me explain the points I would have made had you permitted me to testify this morning. I greatly respect the system of checks and balances that our founding fathers established. They wisely assigned each branch of government a distinct and limited role. One of Congress's most important roles is to oversee the work of the executive branch in order to better carry out its legislative duties. Among our most important functions are prosecuting criminals, making sure innocent people are not charged, and punishing wrongdoing. When there is disagreement between the branches, our task as public servants is to find solutions that permit both branches to do their jobs. That is why I offered to testify this morning and why Director Free and I came up to visit with you last week to try to reach an accommodation with the committee which allows you to pursue your oversight responsibilities while minimizing any interference with our ongoing criminal investigation. As you know, the Department of Justice is conducting an investigation into allegations of criminal activity surrounding the financing of the 1996 presidential election. That investigation has charged 11 persons and is still very much ongoing. We have more leads to run down, more evidence to obtain and analyze, and more work to do. More than 120 dedicated prosecutors, agents, and staff are working on this investigation every day. And many targets, suspects, and defense lawyers are watching our every move, hoping for clues that will tip them off and help them escape the law's reach. Mr. Chairman, you have demanded that I provide two memoranda to the committee. One was written by Director Free last fall, the other by Mr. Labella and Mr. DiSarno. We have reviewed your request very seriously. Our concerns are set forth in the letter Director Free and I sent to you on July 28. Last week, Director Free and I again offered an accommodation that we believe protects both your oversight role and our prosecutorial responsibilities. We explain that this memo is extensive, that I need to review it carefully and thoroughly, and, when, and that when I finish my review, I may or may not decide to trigger the Independent Counsel Act. The Justice Department is willing to provide the leadership of the committee with a confidential briefing on appropriate portions of the Labella Memorandum after I've had an opportunity to evaluate it fully in approximately three weeks. According to Director Free, these memoranda offer a roadmap to confidential, ongoing criminal investigations. Even excluding grand jury inf information, which you are not seeking, such documents lay out the thinking, theories, and strategies of our prosecutors and investigators, and the strengths and weaknesses of our cases. They talk about leads that need further investigation and places where we have reached dead ends. Criminals, targets, and defense lawyers alike can all agree on one thing. They would love to have a prosecutor's plans. Mr. Labella's memorandum provides an overview of the investigation at this time. I am reviewing it with an open mind. If I do make a decision to appoint an independent counsel after you have taken an internal memo still under review, how will anyone believe that my decision was independent, as the law requires? Indeed, to provide this memorandum to the committee would be a grave disservice to an independent counsel if one were appointed and could undermine his or her ability to carry out an effective criminal investigation. 
there are sound public policy reasons as well as law enforcement reasons why we cannot provide this document to the committee. Suppose, for example, a congressional committee wants to stop us from prosecuting someone the committee supports. What's to stop the committee from threatening department lawyers with contempt? The gentleman's time has expired. I ask unanimous consent to conclude reading the Attorney General's letter. Uh, I, I, I think the gentleman will have five minutes to conclude his reading of the record uh, uh, letter. Well, <laughs> all right, proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> What's to stop the committee from threatening department lawyers with contempt, forcing them to produce their internal memos and making them public to everyone, including the defendant's legal team. To demand the prosecutor's documents while the case is in progress would irreversibly taint our principles of justice and could harm the reputations of innocent people or even place witnesses in danger of retaliation. Such policies also would subject every prosecution decision to second-guessing and accusations that congressional pressure affected the Justice Department's decision-making. Even when conducting vigorous oversight, Congress has respected the principle that law enforcement must be free from even the appearance of partisan political tampering. And the Justice Department has adhered to this position for the better part of a century under presidents from Teddy Roosevelt to Ronald Reagan and under FBI directors from J. Edgar Hoover to Louis Free. More than 50 years after they were written, I ask you to consider the words of Attorney General Robert H. Jackson, who later served on the Supreme Court. Quote, it is the position of the department that all investigative reports are confidential documents of the executive department of the government to aid in the duty laid upon the President by the Constitution to take care that the laws be faithfully executed and that congressional or public access to them would not be in the public interest. Twelve years ago, the head of the Justice Department's legal counsel during President Reagan's administration, Charles J. Cooper, added, another co added other concerns, including, quote, well-founded fears that the perception of the integrity, impartiality, and fairness of the law enforcement process as a whole will be damaged if sensitive material is distributed beyond those persons necessarily involved in the investigation and prosecution process. I know that you have cited several examples that you believe contradict these long-standing opinions, but we have analyzed your examples and none of them deal with the demand you have made to turn over law enforcement sensitive documents during a pending criminal investigation. Mr. Chairman, we have worked very hard to respond to congressional oversight requests. Since I became Attorney General, I and many other members of this department have testified dozens of times, turned over thousands of documents, answered thousands of letters, and provided countless briefings on matters large and small. As our campaign finance investigation has progressed, we have made every effort and taken extraordinary steps to accommodate your committee's needs while protecting the integrity of the investigation. We have provided extensive testimony and briefings, including private briefings this winter, about the contents of an internal memo by FBI Director Louis Free. If future attorneys general know that the innermost thinking behind their toughest law enforcement decisions will become fodder for partisan debate. Then we risk creating a Justice Department and an FBI that tax to political winds instead of following the facts and the law wherever they lead. If future law enforcement professionals cannot provide advice that is candid and confidential, we will have a government of yes-men who advocate what is popular instead of what is right. And if future Congresses can poll the Attorney General's advisors or line attorneys in order to ferret out and promote opinions they approve of, then every controversial law enforcement decision will be tainted in the public's eyes. 
All of these concerns are most acute when Congress demands information and seeks to pressure me on a sensitive law enforcement matter that I have not yet made. Given the importance of this matter, I would appreciate your including this letter in the hearing record. Thank you. Sincerely, Janet Reno. Uh, before I yield to uh, Mr. Hastert, uh, let me just say that uh, we have uh, had the congressional research people uh, check out precedents. Uh, there are precedents for what we're doing, number one. Uh, number two, uh, Janet Reno evidently contacted you on the Democrat side before she contacted me about appearing before our committee today and she called me 15 minutes before the hearing. And uh, number three, this letter which you just read into the record, I didn't even have when you started reading it. And I think it's unseemly for the Attorney General to be contacting the minority before she contacts the Chairman of this committee regarding uh, things that she requests to be inserted in the record or her appearance. It's obvious to me that she believes that uh, she needs to take partisan advantage with the Democrats, and I think that's unfortunate. Mr. Hastert. I thank the Chairman. I just a question. Uh, what is five minutes is the time allotted? And the gentleman from California had an additional eight minutes allotted. That's extraordinary, is that correct? The, the gentleman had an extra eight minutes. I'm just I, trying to make that... I only yeah, did that because of uh, thank you, uh, uh, comedy. <clears throat> Mr. Free, uh, Director Free, uh, the memo that's in contention here that we've been talked about has certainly been cir circulated in justice. Is that correct? It's going around the, to be looked at and studied. Yes, Mr. Labella mentioned individuals who he believes have copies of the memo, and even some of those people that have copies of the memo are political appointees, is that correct? Well, again, I don't know myself who has the memo, and I don't know who the Attorney General is consulting with. Uh, it certainly could include both, but I don't know who they are. Well, I understand there are political appointees that have a copy of the memo. And uh, I, I would just think that that probably would be an uncomfortable situation if you have political people in the Justice Department that this memo is not open to anybody. It's certainly not open to uh, this committee and may or may not be open to others uh, in Congress later on, but you have political people that are actually looking at the road map uh, of where things are going. I just think that probably looks, and I'm sure the Attorney General would not make, would, be, would not have an impropriety here, but it certainly looks like there may have been an impropriety. Is that probably some of the ideas that, that you're thinking about when you ask that we maybe they need to go outside? Um, no, actually it's not. Um you know, the Attorney General's uh, past and present always have political appointees serving in key leadership positions. They're called Schedule C appointments, and uh, that's always been the tradition. I have uh, uh, the greatest confidence in the uh, integrity and the honesty of those individuals, including the current ones who may have it, that, you know, they're going to treat the memo with the security and confidence that it requires and give the Attorney General her uh, uh, her requested advice. So I'm, I'm really not concerned about that. Well, I, I probably agree. I'm sure that anybody that the Attorney General would uh, trust and confidence that memo circulating would be of the highest uh, and there wouldn't be any impropriety that would take place or is, uh, certainly as important as this or anybody that would be unprofessional. But there certainly is room for the appearance of that. And I think that's where this whole legitimately uh, legitimacy of this investigation uh, keys on. And I think, you know, again, I can't get in your mind and your memos are uh, there for review, but I would uh, speculate that probably when you look at justice and what uh, needs to be done, uh, probably needs to be balanced and to make sure that there isn't even an appearance of impropriety. And in your past investigations, uh, certainly that you've been involved in. You've tried to make sure that there is no appearance of impropriety. Is that correct? That's always our, uh, our objective, as I'm sure it is the Attorney General's. And, you know, it's not unusual for the Attorney General or the Atten Attorney General's office, Department of Justice, uh, to turn down recommendations uh, from other law, uh, legal agencies, law uh, enforcement agencies, is that correct? I mean, it happens quite often. 
it, it happens often there. It happens in uh, you know all 94 U.S. Attorney's offices every day around the country. So I mean, the recommendations, for instance, of the IRS uh, in 1996 that uh, 280 thousand dollars of uh, campaign funds being money laundered in a certain campaign, the Senate campaign in Illinois, uh, was turned down uh, twice. And uh, but that was certainly for good reason, and uh, I'm sure it was balanced. But those types of recommendations are turned down time and time again, not for political reasons. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, many many times investigators come to prosecutors and ask for prosecution, and uh, professional as well as uh, politically appointed uh, U.S. attorneys and their assistants uh, say yes or no, depending on their analysis of the of the case and the the facts and the law. Uh, I uh, finished with my question, and uh, I will yield back my time. I'm not going to ask for another eight minutes. I was going to pass on to another person in the committee, but I will not do that and wait uh, to take our appropriate time. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from California. Uh, Mr. Uh, Director Free and Mr. Labella, you're both being brought here uh, with uh, the recognition that your career uh, officials uninterested in any political outcome and therefore a great deal of weight is being given to your thoughts and recommendations. But isn't it accurate to say, Director Free, that it's your recommendation that this committee not receive Mr. Labella's memo? I'm sorry, that not? That this committee not receive the Labello memo? Yes, I, I think at this time, as I said, my recommendation is that you don't pursue the subpoena and you, you don't try to discover it, even though I agree you have a legitimate need for the information in there. But for the reasons I set forth, I, I just uh, respectfully gone? ask you to defer it for now. Well, I, I think I'm also not a career appointee. I'm a political That's appointee. You are a political appointee, but yes, with sir. a defined term. Uh, I mean, what we see here is deference being paid to your recommendations when the chairman approves of them, but no deference to your recommendations when he disapproves. And if we go to a contempt citation this Thursday against the Attorney General of the United States, it will be because she refused to turn over the memo uh, written by you, Director Free, and the memo written by Mr. Labello, which both of you, I assume, think this committee should not receive at this point. I certainly believe it, it, it not prudent to receive it at this point, and I think, uh, again, respectfully, the contempt citation, well beyond the Attorney General, will send a, a very uh, chilling message to prosecutors and uh, special agents around the country. So I urge you to just as I know you will, deliberate very carefully about that because the implications go well beyond this issue and this Attorney General. Very much. Uh, Mr. LaBella, did you, you concur in that view? The last thing in the world that I want to see as, as the, the um, prosecutor heading this task force is that this memo ever get disclosed. I'll go beyond three weeks. I don't think that it should ever see the light of day uh, because th this, in my judgment, would be devastating to the to the investigations that the men and women of the task force are, are working on right now and that I put my blood sweat and tears into and I don't want to see that jeopardized and I I would even be stronger than the director I I, I can't see a, a set of circumstances under which this report should see the light of day I understand that perhaps at some time there can be a confidential briefing of some of the aspects in this report but if I were an independent counsel going to get this case, or if I'm a, a, a prosecutor who's going to prosecute these cases later on, the first thing that I want to do is talk to me. The second thing I want to do is to read this report. And the third thing I want not to happen is that this report see the light of day, because that would just undercut what any prosecutor would do with these investigations, whether they're an independent counsel or a Department of Justice prosecutor. That's my belief as a career prosecutor. And so, uh, Mr. Desarno, do you agree? Yes, I think it would be devastating if that uh, if that report were to ma be made public. Well, if we're if we're taking your <coughs> uh, recommendations with a great deal of weight, I think this committee ought to take as well with a great deal of weight your thoughts that we ought not to be pursuing this subpoena and holding the attorney general in contempt for refusing to do what all three of you say would be irresponsible 
uh, for her to do, which would be to turn over the, the, the memos. I, I want to yield uh, whatever remaining time I have to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. How much time does he have? Thank you, Mr. Ba Waxman. In the letter that uh, is dated August the 3rd, directed to uh, Attorney General Reno by the chairman of this committee, which this uh, committee majority adopted a, a few moments ago as its position statement on this issue. There is a paragraph that I'd like to ask your opinion regarding. It's over on the second page of the letter. And it says in the middle of that paragraph, mm -hmm. however, in this case, it appears that your own actions, referring to uh, Attorney General Reno, are far more, far more prejudicial to the activities of the task force that is her withholding of the memos. <clears throat> the hopeless conflicts inherent in your continued investigation of these matters undermines public confidence in this investigation both within and outside the department. The bureaucratic infighting between those who think this would be handled should this would be handled by an outside counsel free of any political appointees meddling must certainly have daily impact upon the investigation. The question I have for you is, has the memos and the opinions expressed in the memos that you, Mr. Free, and Mr. LaBella have written to the Attorney General, has it in fact, as suggested by this letter from Chairman Burton, resulted in bureaucratic infighting which has had a daily impact upon the investigation of the campaign finance abuses which you have been pursuing? As far as the task force lawyers are concerned, um, they're not involved in any bureaucratic infighting. They're professionals who are dealing with their investigations on a day-to-day -day basis, and they continue to do their jobs as excellently as they have in the past. Um, so it's, from my perspective, um, for the task force itself, the people who are on the ground doing the real work in this case, they are not, um, uh, I don't think, uh, hampered by this, uh, is this this debate that goes on, and as far as we're concerned at the task force, is a sideshow to what we're doing. We're about the business of doing the public's work. We're about the business of investigating these allegations as vigorously and as thoroughly as we can. And I think the men and women of the task force are continue to do that. What happens with the with the policy wonks at, at the Department of Justice or the or the supervisors? I have no idea. They may be engaged uh, in in. in something something else but the task force's work continues yeah. gentlemen's time has expired uh, mr. Cox uh, thank the chairman uh, I just want to button down what I understand to be a testimony already given by each of our three witnesses and that is that since July 16th the date that you mr. labella uh, provided your memorandum to the Attorney General since that date uh, the Attorney General has not spoken to you about it uh, has not spoken to Mr. Desario about it and has not spoken to the director of the FBI about it. Uh, is that correct from each of the three of you? Yes, sir. Yes, but, it, but in fairness to the Attorney General, I mean, she has spoken to me about reviewing the report. She is reviewing it, and she said to me that she does want an opportunity to speak with me after she's reviewed the report, and I expect, fully expect, that, that we will have contact, I will have contact with her. Uh, about the report, but to date, I have not spoken to her about. But at the least during the report. intervening three weeks, uh, the people with whom she has been meeting about this decision uh, do not include any of the three of you. That's correct. Uh, in her letter that uh, was presented to us during the course of this hearing, the attorney general cited an OLC opinion, the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice, written 12 years ago by Charles J. Cooper, whom I know to be a very fine and able lawyer. Uh, he was then the Assistant Attorney General and the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, and that is the authority that she cites uh, uh, briefly in her memorandum uh, 
for the proposition that um, uh, sensitive material should not be distributed beyond those persons uh, involved or necessarily involved in the process. That is uh, a difficult proposition with which to argue. The entirety of Mr. Cooper's memorandum, however, is even more impressive. Uh, it is uh, directly relevant to what we are describing here in that case, and at the time I worked with Mr. Cooper when he was the Assistant Attorney General uh, in charge of OLC, I was in the White House Counsel's Office, uh, on the particular matter that was the subject of this memorandum. Uh, and uh, he, he states definitively in this very report uh, to the Attorney General and the President that uh, Attorney General Reno cites that there are only two defenses that the executive branch can mount in order to defy a subpoena of Congress. One is that Congress lacks jurisdiction and the other way is to assert executive privilege. And uh, a reading of Mr. Cooper's memo makes it very clear that uh, uh, in a case such as this where our ongoing investigation of uh, a year and a half is the very same subject that you're investigating, that there isn't much question that Congress has uh, the jurisdiction to do this and this committee has the jurisdiction to do it. Uh, and thus we are left with only one other ground, and that is executive privilege. Now, in the Cooper Memorandum, he says, and I quote, the decision to assert executive privilege in response to a congressional subpoena is the President's to make. Executive privilege cannot be asserted vis-a-vis -vis Congress without specific authorization by the President. And so I'll ask uh, uh, each of the three of you whether you are aware of uh, uh, any effort uh, made uh, to appropriately, uh, uh, under this OLC opinion, uh, fail to respond to the subpoena issued by this committee? And I'll just move left to right and start with you, Mr. LaBella. You're asking me if I'm aware of anybody um, asserting executive privilege with respect to this memo? Whether, according to uh, this OLC memorandum, the process it sets out is, is being followed in this case. I'm not aware of, of anything in the department. Uh, Director Freed? I'm not aware of it, sir. Nor am I aware of it, sir. Uh, do you have any reason to disagree, since this was the subject of your testimony today, uh, disagree with the uh, 1986 OLC memo that the Attorney General cites? No. No. So, uh, uh, may we expect then that uh, at least insofar as you are concerned, that uh, the Justice Department will appropriately uh, adhere to that precedent? I, th I, think the, I think the fact that the Attorney General cites that uh, indicates that that's the opinion by which he's being guided in this matter. Uh, as to the specific decisions or developments from here on in, I, I certainly can't predict. Uh, I think my time is uh, about to expire, and uh, Gen would the gentleman yield real yes. briefly? I think the point that <clears throat> he's trying to make is that when you hear the complete analysis by the gentleman in question, he makes it very clear that the only avenue the Attorney General has to deny our legitimacy as far as that subpoena is concerned is if the President claims executive privilege. It has not been done. Therefore, the subpoena is valid and should be, should stand. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just uh, reclaiming my time for whatever is not left of it, uh, what this OLC opinion states very clearly, and I happen to agree with it, is that Congress may not invoke its contempt power if the administration properly asserts executive privilege over this memorandum. But uh, according to the OLC memo, the only way that this memorandum can be kept from Congress in the face of a subpoena is either to say that Congress lacks jurisdiction, which is clearly not appropriate here, uh, or to say that uh, uh, executive privilege has been claimed, and as the opinion points out, by the President himself. I thank the uh gentleman's time has expired. Uh, is, who's, who's next? The uh, gentleman from California. <coughs> At the beginning of your testimony, Director Free, you paid great tribute to the Attorney General, to her honesty, to her integrity. I take it your 
tribute to her integrity and independence is unqualified. Is that correct? Absolutely unqualified. Mr. Labella, how would you rate the Attorney General's integrity and independence? Without question. I've worked with her um, since September directly, and um, I, don't, I don't question anything she's done. I give her my best judgment. She makes her best decision. Your, your statement, therefore, would be that her integrity and independence is beyond question. Beyond reproach. Unqualified. Mr. Yes. DiSarno, would you agree with that? I would agree it is beyond reproach. Having established the fact that the Attorney General is a person of extraordinary character and integrity and independence, uh, what we are left with is the quality of the investigation. And as I recall, a few minutes ago, all three of you gentlemen testified that no independent counsel investigation could be more professional, more thorough, more complete than what uh, your office, Director Free, is conducting. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, I find it rather disturbing when the chairman asks you to comment on whether the Attorney General is applying the law correctly or not. Because I take it, as was pointed out earlier, when a Supreme Court comes down with a 5-4 to four decision, it's quite clear that all nine justices may be applying the law correctly. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. How about a 7-2 to two decision? Same analysis. How about an 8-1 to one decision? Same result. Same, same answer. So what we are really dealing with is the judgment of the Attorney General who under the independent counsel statute applies her decision and no one questions that she has the right to do so. Is that correct? I don't question it. I don't think anybody here does. So insofar as members of Congress have a complaint about what the Attorney General is doing, they have a recourse, which is to change the law. Is that correct? Could certainly do that, yes, sir. The Attorney General cannot change the law. Is that correct? No. Only Congress can change the law. So we have been witnessing the harassment of this extraordinary woman for months and months for having the courage to state her judgment which she is entitled to do and under the law is compelled to do. Am I correct in this interpretation, Director Free? Well, I, I don't want to agree or disagree with your characterization. You don't it's have certainly to. Certainly a lively and valid dispute between lawyers, between professors, between members of Congress, and I'm sure uh, even uh, without our uh, immediate uh, attention between judges and others about whether the statute should be applied. But that's the uh, nature of the authority that is given to the Attorney General. She is clearly not engaged in any wrongdoing. Is that correct? Uh, of course not. And only totalitarian societies have the tendency where the powers that be attempt to criminalize conduct or views contrary to their own. Would you agree with that generalization? Yes. That in free and open societies, individuals, even government officials, even the Attorney General is entitled to express her own judgment. Well, not only entitled here, but required by law required by, by law to, do, to so. do so. And harassment of that individual for having the courage to express her own views and, in fact, being obliged by law to do so uh, is extraordinary. I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields his time. Um, Mr. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome our director and his good uh, associates uh, to our committee today, and we appreciate your being of assistance to the work of the committee. 
Um, let me ask uh, uh, Director Free, when was this task force first uh, formed? Task force was formed uh, in early 1997. And has been at work continuously since that date? Yes, sir. And Mr. Labella was the uh, direct, uh, chairman of the task force, is that correct? I was the supervising uh, attorney since uh, September of last year. And uh, Mr. DeSero was also part of the task force? Yes, sir. Since uh, September of 97, uh, I was the lead investigator. And uh, um, at what point did you first make your report available, Mr. Labella, with regard to your recommendation to the Attorney General? The evening of July 16th. The evening of July 16th. Uh, of what year? This year. This year. And that's after more than a year of work in the task force, is that correct? Well, I had been there since September of uh, the the prior year. So about 10, 10 months, almost 11 months of working. And you based that upon the investigations of the task force? Yes. Based my, your report? And my analysis of the law and the facts as I saw them, yes. And how did you submit your report to the Attorney General? I gave her a written copy of my report. Personally? Yes. Did uh, you have an opportunity after you submitted the report to personally discuss the report with the Attorney General? No, it's a 94-page report with a stack of exhibits that probably is a foot thick. And um, I handed it to her. She thanked me, and, and we didn't discuss it that evening. Um, did anyone at any time, either the Attorney General or one of her assistants, ask you to come in to discuss the report after you submitted it? Uh, not up until today, um, but the Attorney General phoned me, um, I believe it was on Sunday after I flew in, and she said she intends to discuss it with me uh, when she's finished reviewing it, and Mr. Robinson has asked um, for us to get together sometime to discuss it over the next that several was days. this past Sunday? Yes. And you first submitted it, what was the date when you submitted it to her? Uh, the night of July 16th. Um, did anyone uh, ask you to submit the report or to write it out? How did that come about that you made that report or request? Actually, um, no one asked me to make a report or do a report. It was my own idea to do a report because I was having trouble keeping um, all the facts and circumstances in my head from all the various investigations. And also, I was having difficulty connecting all the... the um, the pieces of circumstantial and direct evidence which which a prosecutor does in the normal course and an investigator does in the normal course of an investigation. This is not one investigation. This is a series of several different investigations from which facts bubble up. So you summarized those investigations in your report? I, I summarized the, the key facts and the key elements of the investigations, yes. And based on that summary, you made a recommendation? I did. And that recommendation was for the appointment of an independent counsel? That's correct. And did you discuss your report with Director Free? Uh, no. I mean, we, we, had, we had brief conversations about the investigations previously because we worked together. Did you submit a copy of your report to Director Free? Actually, uh, Mr. DeSarno gave the copy to the, uh, to the uh, director. The, the, the memo was... It's an interim report for the Attorney General and for the Director. It's, it's directed to both, and it was prepared by myself and Mr. DeSarno. And we're you both submitted it to the Director about the same time you submitted it to it the, the Attorney same night. General? Um, director Free, had uh, the Attorney General asked you to discuss the report at any time? Mr. LaBelle's report, no, sir. Um, and base, uh, uh, based upon, uh, re d you reviewed Mr. Uh, Labella's report, is that correct? Yes, sir. And when did you first see the report? Um, I saw it the day that it was delivered, Thursday, July 16th. Uh, and that's this year? Yes, sir. And after reviewing the report, did you come to some determination as to whether or not there ought to be an independent counsel? Well, um, I had already come to that determination in terms of my own recommendation. Having uh, read uh, Mr. Labella's report and having studied it, I certainly agreed with his uh, conclusions and the information as he developed it in that document. And when did you first come to the conclusion before the Labella report that there should be an independent counsel? Well, uh, I certainly recommended that to the Attorney General in November 
and uh, we had discussed that prior to November of 1997 a number of occasions and I had on several of those occasions uh, recommended that there be an independent counsel. And when the Attorney General received the LaBella report, did she ask to discuss that report with you? Did she re discuss that LaBella report at any time with you after receiving it? She's not yet done that, but again, I expect that that will happen as soon as she's prepared to discuss it. Jim, Thank Jim. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Thank you. time has expired. Uh, Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Turner, I think, had, had five minutes uh, a while ago. Didn't you not, did you yes. not have five minutes? No, I was, I concluded using the balance of Mr. Waxman's time. So you have not been recognized for five minutes? I have minutes? not been recognized. Then you're recognized for five minutes. Back in a minute, Mr. Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Free, it, it seems to me that we can legitimately debate the authority of this committee to subpoena documents uh, such as these memorandum. Um, it being clear to me that a claim of executive privilege would clearly lie, but short of that we may have disagreements uh, regarding the authority of this committee uh, to subpoena documents such as these memorandum. But I think the more critical issue is the question regarding the wisdom, the appropriateness of issuing a subpoena to secure your memorandum and Mr. Labella's memorandum. And I would like to ask um, first Mr. Labella, what would your view be regarding the impact of disclosing your memorandum on the pending criminal investigations that you have been conducting? My opinion is, as a prosecutor, I think it would be devastating, and I, I just, I mean, I just couldn't imagine trying to continue to investigate these cases vigorously and effectively with this information available. And if this memorandum that you wrote were disclosed, what impact do you think it would have on an independent counsel who may be later appointed to conduct this investigation? If I were that independent counsel, I'd be mad as hell. Mr. Free, do you think the threat of a contempt of Congress citation against the Attorney General has the appearance of compromising the independence of the Attorney General that she's required to exercise under the Independent Counsel Act? I don't know that um I don't know that I could answer with respect to appearances. I mean, it depends, you know, who you're talking about in what context. Uh, my own strong belief, as I've expressed it several times here today, is that the uh, effect of a subpoena executed by uh, contempt authority uh, at this particular time, uh, specifically, would have a very uh, damaging impact and a adverse impact on prosecutors, investigators, and I've asked, uh, of course, as is uh, known, the committee to uh, please carefully consider that before proceeding. I suppose if we were concerned about the appearance of uh, compromising the Attorney General's independence by forcing her hand with a contempt of Congress citation, that uh, the committee majority could have determined simply to have cited you for contempt of Congress for not delivering the subpoena that you wrote to this committee, could it not? Certainly could pursue that, yes sir. And I suppose as you sit here today, if the chair were to ask you questions specifically regarding the contents of your memorandum uh, and refuse to allow you to defer on certain points in your memorandum, you could also be cited for contempt of Congress for not asking, answering the questions regarding the content of that report, could you not? Committee could certainly pursue that, yes, sir. And I think we all understand uh, that that course of action would uh, belie the uh, comments that have been made here earlier by some who would suggest that there are certain things in your memorandum that would not be appropriate to be released. 
Is that correct? I certainly believe there are things in there that should not uh, be released. And those are things beyond grand jury testimony that by law you cannot reveal. Am I not correct? Yes, beyond 6E material. I'll yield to... Uh, I, I just want to ask one question. The chairman has made the statement, I don't know if he made it publicly or privately, that he thinks the attorney general is just covering up for the White House and the Democrats, and that's why she's not cooperating. Do any of you believe that, Director Free? No, I don't believe that at all. Mr. LaBella? No, I wouldn't have stayed on the task force for as long as I did if I believed that for would a second. It would have been a violation of law. And you, she would be committing a criminal act, wouldn't it? That's correct. And Mr. DeSarno? No, sir, I don't believe that. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to look at the independent council statue uh, with the Teamsters Democratic National Committee campaign swap. But to lay the predicate here, looking at the statue as to the coups a covered official, it notes here, quote, the chairman and treasurer of the principal national campaign committee seeking the election or re-election of the president and any officer of that committee exercising authority at the national level during the incumbency of the president, unquote. And uh, the attorney general also, as you know, has discretion in this matter under certain things. You do not have to have a specified office alone to trigger the uh, coverage of the Independent Counsel Act. And then, of course, she has to look at the specific allegations and see if they're credible uh, enough to commence a 90-day preliminary investigation. Now, as I look at some of the background on this uh, swap of money between the alleged swap of money between the Teamsters Union and the election of Mr. Kerry uh, and the uh, Democratic National Committee, I'm rather fascinated here on the case that has been brought by the Southern District of New York where an indictment has been filed against uh, William W. Hamilton, Jr., the former governmental affairs director of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. The indictment alleges that Mr. Hamilton committed six felonies involving what the Southern District calls, and I quote, quote, plans to swap, unquote. Teamster funds, quote, in exchange for the Democratic National Committee raising money, unquote, for the re-election campaign of then Teamsters President Ron Carey. How the deal would work is that they would get individual donors to give money to Carey, and the Teamsters would give Political Action Committee money to the Democratic National Committee. In addition to the charges against Mr. Hamilton, the indictment states that certain high-ranking Democratic National Committee and Clinton-Gore officials committed nine, quote, overt acts, unquote, in furtherance of the contribution swap. Now, two other people have pled to guilt to the charges related to this contribution swap scheme. Documents filed by the Southern District in this case show that at least the following people knew about the scheme. Harry <coughs> McAuliffe, the former National De Finance Chairman, Clinton Gore, Laura Hartigan, the Clinton Gore Finance Director, and Richard Sullivan, the Democratic National Committee Finance Director. The indictment of Mr. Hamilton also states that an unnamed Democratic National Committee official, presumably Mr. Sullivan, took steps in furtherance of the swap scheme. Now, furthermore, both McAuliffe and uh, Sullivan's involvement in the contribution swaps were discussed in the November 1997 decision of the election officer appointed to oversee the 1996 election for the Teamsters presidency. Now, according to the report, Ron Carey told a cooperating witness that he called McAuliffe, quote, to thank him for his help with fundraising for his campaign, unquote. Now, what I'd like to ask you, gentlemen, is, Mr. LaBella, Mr. Free in particular, are you familiar with the allegations set forth in the charging indictments filed by the Southern District of New York or in the election officer's report I referred to of the contribution swaps between the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton-Gore officials and the Teamsters? How familiar are you with that? From the I task force, relevant to this situation, right? From the task force's perspective, we're very familiar with the investigation. We work um, closely with the Southern District prosecutors, and we constantly monitor the development of of that case. 
Mr. Free? Yes, I'm very familiar with the facts and the allegations and the charges. Mr. DeSarno? Yes, sir, Mr. Horn. We're familiar with it at the task force. Now, I realize the uh, Office of United States Attorney for the Southern District has a long heritage of being pretty independent and really doesn't take orders from anyone, whether they're Republican attorney, U.S. attorneys, or Democratic U.S. attorneys. And uh, I guess I'm curious, why is the Southern District, which reports, when you look on the organization chart, technically to the Attorney General, although each attorney general, I'm sure, can set out who particular U.S. attorneys report and do they deal with the assistant attorney general for criminal or civil or whatever. I understand that. And the Southern District here, which reports that way, investigating the top money people, the finance chairman for both the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton-Gore campaign for the 1996 elections. Isn't this really a textbook case for the appointment of an independent counsel? Don't all leap at answering. Well, I'll, I'll leap into it. Um, I, I think the way to answer the question is that we have, we have analyzed the issues, we have analyzed the people involved, and we have <clears throat> come to the conclusion that um, the, the Independent Counsel Act isn't triggered by what has developed to date. It's not triggered. It is, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I heard Not triggered. It is not triggered. <clears throat> not triggered. Okay, now is it not triggered because their title equals the one specified in the Act? Because it seems to me when they say, and other national, uh, the language <laughs> I read here from the Act, uh, they named the chairman and the treasurer of the principal national campaign committee seeking the election or re-election of the president and any officer of that committee exercising authority at the national level. The people I've named are all exercising authority at the national level. It's a two-fold two process. Uh, whether or not there's uh, specific information from a credible source of wrongdoing uh, and whether the person is within the, uh, the mandatory provision. Um, the analysis been, has been done. Um, the act has not been triggered with respect to that, um, um, that case. We are constantly monitoring that case. We are briefed uh, periodically, probably every two weeks, about that case, the developments in that case. Uh, if, as and when, something uh, develops in that case that would give us concern under the Independent Counsel Act, I think we'll act upon it. I, I know we will. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, okay, we might get back to it then. Okay, Mr. Kanjorski. I, I understand the New York Times uh, reported the existence of the memo, and that disturbs me greatly. How, how is it the, that the New York Times has such a, a clear uh, ability to get with inside the Justice Department and, and get to a critical as this that I think could compromise any criminal cases you may have. All I can tell you is what I did. I made three copies of my memorandum, uh, my report. I gave Jim DeSarno had one to give to the director, which he got. I gave one to the Attorney General personally, and I kept one myself, which was promptly boxed up and sent to San Diego because I thought I thought I was going home. Um, at some later time copies were made uh, and I believe on Tuesday copies were made and on Thursday the article appeared in the uh, the New York Times obviously it was a leak obviously someone somewhere is familiar with the at least the broad part said something to a reporter this is not unlike unlike a leak heard about six months or nine months ago of the director of the FBI who prepared a memorandum for the Attorney General and it was on the street in a matter of has the Department of Justice undertaken an examination of this problem? The Department of Justice right now has several leak investigations ongoing. I myself have been deposed. I know all the agents and the several of the lawyers working on the task force have been deposed. Uh, and there are ongoing investigations concerning several of these leaks. One of these days we're going to have somebody put a resolution in the Congress to rename it the Department of CIV. It seems to me that uh, uh, it, it is hardly something that we should be proud of that investigative forces of the United States government can gather information, some of which is hearsay, some of which is untrue and false, not tried for validity in any way, 
and that circulates and then gets out to the press. Uh, we've seen this carried on with the uh, special independent counsel. Uh, I, I think maybe this committee should be exercising its jurisdiction to find out what in the hell is happening with these, quote, supposedly insulated high governmental officials charged with extraordinary, extraordinary powers to investigate extraordinary high people in the elective process of this government. And uh, I mean, I, I know the New York Times is a pretty important institution, but I was never aware of the fact that uh, uh, they would so readily be able to get such a, a valuable internal document. Uh, Mr. Freed, do you have an explanation for this? Or? No, well, I don't think they have the document. And I don't think uh, anybody has uh, my memorandum. I think there's uh, reported information about the contents, uh, some accurate, some perhaps the documents, I'm quite confident, uh, are still within the control of a very few number of people. But to a larger issue, as I said here when I testified, uh, last year. There's nothing more frustrating for uh, me and I'm sure everyone else than the constant leaks that we see, not just in this case, but many other cases. I, I talked to you, I think, last year about it, Mr. Director, that very issue. Yes, we did. And I think you told me that you're going back and making sure you're going to close this situation down. And I was about it when I picked up the paper and read of this memorandum because I'm, I'm not at all sure philosophically or public policy wise why we just aren't having this task force proceed with campaign finance crimes. And and that's one of the questions. I know my time's almost running out. Mr. Lobel, I understand you're going back to San Diego. Uh, are you done? Is your task force over? No, I still have a hand in the task force. I still run several of the cases with Dave Sinan's coming on board and, and who I've spent a lot of time with bringing up to speed on investigations. I, w I would think you're just about getting up to the point where you should start bringing indictments Executions. Why would the chief counsel, who had all that faith placed in him to make all this inquiry, in the midst of uh, the most important time, decide to go back home? Well, the New York Times says I'm going home because I'm homesick. They also say separately that I'm a patsy prosecutor. Um, what do you the say? Fa the, fact is, the fact is I'm going home because um, the U.S. attorney in San Diego left his position. I was the first assistant. Uh, that is the person who takes over the office traditionally when the U.S. attorney leaves before his or her term is up. I went back to assume that responsibility because my my first job was to the Southern District of California. Um, they sent me on detail to Washington to get. Yep. Wouldn't, this that wouldn't that argument be somewhat similar? That you found out that the captain had had a heart attack and died. You were the first man and you would be normally taking over, so you're leave leaving the uh, ship. A companion ship, but I haven't left down. abandoned. I'm not letting the ship go uh, uh, without without a captain aboard, uh, so it can run aground. Well, let me ask you this: Do you weigh the district, federal district attorney's office in San Diego, the leadership of that office, with any equal value with the pursuit of uh, criminal prosecution and investigation of a national election of the United States that could affect members of Congress, the Senate, and the Vice President and President of the United States? These investigations have not been handled one, one jot since, since uh, my departure. Again, I'm still involved. We have a, an extremely competent, professional field prosecutor. Uh, well, look, Mr. Task Waller, Force. only yeah, three of you. time has expired. Could I have one more minute? Sure. Well, okay, but we've got several people who've been waiting a long time. Only three of you had that memorandum. Correct. By virtue of leaving, that necessitates that additional people. I think, I think the gentleman's in. The, the, the Attorney General disseminated that to a number of others that was previously testified to. And, and I think that uh, that's part of the problem. Can I, it wasn't a real career-enhancing move for that to be leaked for me personally. So, um, you know, take from that what you will. <laughs> uh, the, the, the leak occurred after the dissemination by the Attorney General to several other people. Uh, Mr. Micah, what's that? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, as uh, you gentlemen know, I chair the uh, House Civil Service Subcommittee and I want to take just a moment to publicly express my appreciation uh, to all of you, your three dedicated uh, public servants, civil servants. Um, 
you were given a very difficult uh, task and uh, you completed that task. I believe you did it uh, very fairly, squarely, honestly. And uh, we do appreciate uh, your sticking to your guns on this uh, uh, difficult assignment. The, the reason we're here is because we've had such a difficult time really uh, getting the facts. You just heard Mr. Kanjorski question you about the leaks. Uh, we do have an important responsibility on this committee uh, of oversight, investigations, uh, including the Department of Justice. Uh, we've been working on the campaign finance matter for several years now and try to work cooperatively but again pick up the paper and you read information that we can't get and this uh, request is to uh, get Mr. LaBelle's uh, memo that he, uh, parts of it have appeared or com commentary has appeared uh, in the paper that we feel we uh, as uh, an investigative body uh, uh, representative of the people uh, should have um, access uh, to. Um, we've run into the same problem. Uh, we've had, I've been down to the floor on Mr. Quinn, papers from the White House on witnesses, uh, and the only way we've been able to achieve anything is through uh, bringing uh, forth these uh, contempt citations, Th and this is a very serious one against the attorney. Uh, general uh, in seeking that information. We don't want to interfere with the uh, the process. Again, we're trying to get to the truth. Um, I have a couple of questions. First, the most startling thing I heard today was uh, when Mr. Free, uh, well, our FBI director said uh, the conduct under investigation in co involves a core of persons, and quote, who are indisputably covered. The core group under investigation includes both covered persons and others who would trigger the discretionary provisions. This again, the FBI director. Does the core group include the president and vice president? Answer, yes, sir, Mr. Free. That to me, is, uh, uh, is, is astounding, and it's your commentary before us, uh, Mr. Free. Mr. Fala, the Wall Street Journal, says, uh, and let me read this, uh, let me read the first part of this. It says, the departing head of the Justice Department campaign fundraising investigation has told Janet Reno he developed evidence of wrongdoing by senior officials of the White House and Democratic National Committee. Charles LaBella's finding presented in a lengthy memorandum to Ms. Reno focused sharply on the fundraising efforts of Harold Ickes, the former White House Chief of Staff, Deputy Chief of Staff, they form the basis of Mr. LaBella's recommendation that you know, seek the appointment of an independent counsel. That's just the prelude. Now, there's a quote. It's not exactly that we presented her with a smoking gun, a senior government official said, but we showed her significant threads of evidence that went right into the White House and to the upper levels of the DNC. Is that your uh, quote, or Mr. Um, LaBella? No, it's not. I would have never said we've shown her threads of evidence because the Independent Counsel Act, as I've tried to point out time and time again to anybody who will listen, says specific information from a credible source. Uh, I believe that, that the concept of evidence and information are two separate concepts. And do you believe that uh, uh, and concur with the statement uh, that this goes uh, right to core group that includes the president and vice president, as we heard testimony from Mr. Free? Comment on the, the, the content of my report with respect to specific factual finally the, predicates. Finally, the thing that concerns me both, and having spent two years on this investigation, is something you said, Mr. LaBella, that this report puts together all the dots. What concerns me is I've put them together too. And it appears that in the quest for illegal foreign money, there was a conspiracy. In the quest uh, for large amounts, amounts of illegal or gray money, there was a conspiracy, and some of that was directed out of the White House. I don't know if you can comment on that or not, but uh, uh, you said about connecting the 
And that's what I think this is all about. And I'm very concerned that this should be in the hands of an independent counsel, not by this committee or anyone else. And I think you found enough evidence to support that uh, suspicion that I have. Is that correct? Well, what I've done uh, in the report is connect dots, but that's my connection, not the Attorney General's connection. With all due respect to the Attorney General, I think she needs time to review this document. That's a fairly meaty document, and it took me several months to put together. Um, I am and not... On the basis of that work, though, you unequivocally recommend the appointment of an independent counsel. Is that correct? That's my recommendation. Thank you, sir. I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, if I could just be heard for one moment in response to Mr. Micah's statement. Let me just be clear about what I said. My answer was in the context of a response to the conflict provision and whether or not I believe there was a sufficient conflict to trigger the statute. And my view is that uh, that is the case. The subject matter of our investigation uh, involves covered persons, uh, including, as I mentioned, the President and the Vice President. I don't think there's anything sounding about that. That's the subject matter of the inquiry. But going back to what I said in my opening statement, it's often misunderstood which is why I was reluctant in December to even tell you my recommendation that a recommendation to trigger the statute under either the substantive provision but fully under the discretionary provision does not mean that I have reached any conclusions about uh, guilt or even a probable cause finding. What the statute says is that only further investigation is warranted and that there is a predicate constitutes a sufficient basis to inquire. So please don't take from uh, my remarks, as I know you, you won't, any indication that I've come to any conclusions or findings about uh, wrongdoing or criminal activity by the President, the Vice President, or anyone else. My recommendation, however, is that in the context of what we are focused on, uh, it should be a, a situation that triggers the, uh, the discretionary provision. Mr. Satter. First, I want to thank you all, too, for your distinguished service, and I'm sorry we're even in a quasi-adversarial position. We're trying to do our job just like you are, and I appreciate your uh, willingness to uh, speak out to the degree that you can within the guidelines of how you understand uh, your duties. Um, Mr. Bella, uh, Attorney General Reno said before the Senate Judiciary Committee on April 30, 1997, that the investigation by the campaign task force is ongoing. I am personally monitoring it closely and regularly. If at any time I find that the requirements of the Independent Counsel Act have been met, I will not hesitate to invoke it as I have in the past. Do you feel that she was surprised by any key facts in your report? In other words, was she indeed, as she said to the Senate Committee, personally, closely and regularly monitoring it? We, we briefed the Attorney General weekly. Uh task force briefs the, briefs the Attorney General weekly uh, on the progress of the task force. As I tried to say, however inartfully before, my idea to put this report together because I was having difficulty keeping all the facts and circumstances of all the separate investigations in my head and drawing what I think the appropriate conclusions a prosecutor would draw, putting them all together, again connecting the dots using that analogy. Um, I didn't have all this in my head at any given time. This was a process for me. It was a several month long process to uh, put this together. Um, there were facts in here that surprised me, but I will say that I felt it was much more compelling once I put it on paper and connected the dots between the several different investigations. Uh, to, I, I don't know what's going on in the, in the Attorney General's head. All I can tell you is that she may not be surprised by anything in here, but certainly this is the first think anybody has done this for her so she can make an informed decision based on the entire fabric of evidence that's out there. It's Im important, however, to show the record that it, if it isn't new key facts or blindsided, it's mainly an organizational question to see it in a systematic form and that she's had three weeks. It becomes a time question if there were new facts here or if there was a major breakthrough that suddenly appeared to her, uh, it would be a different subject matter on I, I will say that there there are theories in here which I will not go into concerning individuals and in and, and legal analysis that I think have been done before and I don't think anybody quite frankly thought of um, myself included until I started to do this report well I, I really so appreciate that, that there's a new, the question there is a new legal analysis in here I think and I think there are some new facts but uh, again I, I think most of it is generally what we've been dealing with over the last 10 11 months 
Well, that leads right into my next question. Um, I'm evolved. glad I could help. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> glad we uh, did this uh, kind of independently without organizing it. Um, that uh, you've said that you felt releasing this report would be devastating. Uh, Attorney General in her letter said that it would tip off defense attorneys. So you're saying that there are things in this report that are significant and have not been in the media? That have not been? In the media thus far. Oh, absolutely. You agree absolutely. with that, Director Free? Y yes, sir, I do. And are you saying there are just a few things that haven't been in the media thus far about your report, or are you saying there's many significant things and that's why it would be so devastating to release this report? I think there are many things in this report that has not been in the media. I think the media has only 1%. I mean, they have the bottom line that I've acknowledged today for the first time, um, and that's, that's really about it. I don't, I don't see much more substance that they have. You realize the problem you've put us in as elected officials, not you, but whoever has leaked this out that, and, and what you just said, because um, this isn't about some dress, and this isn't about whether or not the First Lady had some land deal in Arkansas many years ago. This is about whether foreign money influenced decisions of the United States government and whether other decisions were influenced. Director Freed has said that the President and the Vice President are not necessarily direct targets, but they're indirect targets because the money flowed into their campaign and that that at least was a variable in the recommendations. And what we're saying, if this report doesn't get released, and if she doesn't appoint an independent consul, the American people don't have a right to know specifically uh, about the, the here when we've already seen a pattern in the administration of even in the Attorney General's office, the Deputy Attorney General going to prison for political questions um, and, and abuse of his power. And it, it causes um, a lot of people to become more paranoid than possibly would be justified not illegitimately. In other words, when they saw the Deputy Attorney General, now we have a question even how the memo leaked. And it undermines the confidence that the American people have in their government uh, when you put these combinations together. And in fact, we may never see the light of day, if particularly if there's no independent prosecutor, how do we have any way of knowing whether or not uh, evidence was permanently buried? But I, I think what's on the table now is, is whether or not the Attorney General could be given the time she has is, she is requested to review uh, the document, review the exhibits, and make a, an independent decision that she said she's committed to doing. Um, I don't think three weeks, I personally don't think three weeks is an unreasonable amount of time to do that, um, Even because she has to talk to a lot of people. I mean, it's not going to just accept what, what Chuck says about, about, about the, the appointment of an independent counsel. I am one person. I am one lawyer. I'm one prosecutor. I have mistakes in my career. Maybe she thinks I'm all wet. Maybe she thinks I'm all wrong. I don't know. I haven't discussed it with her yet. Maybe she wants to balance this and get the advice uh, of, of other career prosecutors. For the, for the record, it isn't just you. You headed the investigation. It's the director of the FBI. It's the person who handled the specifics of the investigation who are saying there's a potential conflict of interest and that the American people are already concerned that this whole thing is a partisan thing on our side and the Democratic side. And it seems to me if there was any way to err, it would be to err towards independence and not towards keeping it in this realm of that it has in this committee or in the White House right now. And I just think we should give her the chance to do her job as, as I think she's been doing from the beginning and, and report, make a decision and in three weeks, if nothing's been done, I understand that there's going to be a briefing on the report, which is probably the appropriate way to go. Three additional weeks is right. Yeah. The gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Arizona. I thank you. Uh, let me begin just by talking about this timing question. I would point out that the statute deals with timing. The statute specifically gives her 30 days. By my count, she's had 19 of those days since your report went in. She has 11 left. The number three weeks has been turned around here because that's her request. I'd simply point out that under the time scenario that the chairman is pursuing and that this committee is pursuing, she would not have three weeks. She would have nine weeks. Uh, so I don't think we're rushing it, and that whole discussion I think is off point. Second, uh, I want to make the point that uh, 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 FBI Director Free made the point that the decision to appoint an independent counsel is hers. And I agree with that. We all know that. But the Congress and this committee don't give up their right. It has not given up their right to exercise oversight. This statute specifically gives her both a discretionary section and a mandatory section. And I think it's fully appropriate for us to look into her exercise of function, particularly given that a portion of the statute 
is mandatory. Uh, and I think that's what the hearing is about, and it quite th frankly, I think that's what the subpoenas are about. Now, I want to turn to another issue which uh, I think has consumed most of this hearing, and that is the question of when is it appropriate, when is it not appropriate for the Congress to seek what you, uh, Director Free, characterize as a prosecution memo. Um, I think that uh, my friend Chris Cox pointed out, quite frankly, we have legal authority to get this document. In the absence of an executive privilege or assertion, we don't have jurisdiction, and no one certainly don't have jurisdiction. The question then is, when should we? Your word were, words were, Director Free, that the subpoena was not unprecedented, but it is extraordinary. Um, I want to begin by saying I, have a, I had a law professor, uh, or a college government professor, who said it all depends on whose ox is being gored. Uh, I have sat where you sit. For seven years, I worked in the Arizona Attorney General's office, and I routinely reviewed prosecution memos. Uh, I have sat in meeting, meetings where we discussed this. And I have uh, very, very strong belief that what you have said about a prosecution memo, that is an internal confidential document from a line prosecutor to the person who's on the bottom line, uh, the Attorney General, the County Attorney, in my case it was the Attorney General, uh, is an important document that ought not to routinely go uh, and that there are dangerous consequences, Mr. Labella, I agree, if they do routinely go public, uh, because that can destroy the prosecution, it can inhibit prosecutors in their jobs. And I think, uh, Director Free, you made a good point when you said that the subpoena is not unprecedented, but it is extraordinary. And I guess I'd like to walk through how extraordinary it is, and then I want to talk about the position that we're in as public officials. I think any investigation which goes to corruption of the political process at the highest level of the nation is in fact itself extraordinary. I think it's extraordinary when you have a criminal investigation of the president. I think it's extraordinary when you have a possible criminal investigation or, po or criminal investigation of possible conduct by the vice president. I think the special counsel statute itself is extraordinary and when it gets invoked it is extraordinary. I think when you have an allegation of possible criminal conduct by, by the White House, that is extraordinary. But I think it is particularly extraordinary for two other reasons. Number one, in this particular case, we have already leaked to the public, so the American public knows that in this case, the chief investigator, uh, Mr. DeSarno, uh, the chief prosecutor, as it were, Mr. Labella, and the director of the FBI all have expressed their opinion that an independent counsel is called for under the statute, and that has become known publicly. And on top of that, um, Two of them have written reports uh, which are known to the public. Uh, Mr. Uh, Free, you have written a report which we tried to get before and we deferred. You said we did, you thought it was important not to release it. We did not uh, obtain it then. Now Mr. Labella has written another report reaching the uh, same conclusion. I think all of those are, are particularly extraordinary, but particularly extraordinary when it's only the Attorney General who said it should not be released. Uh, I think it's extraordinary because it's publicly known. The average prosecution member isn't known about. And I know deep concern about the fact that if we release this memo, the public will know what its secrets are and the defense attorneys will know. And yet, I would point out that had it never been leaked, and I trust that none of you leaked, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. We're in a position now where the public knows that the three of you gentlemen uh, believe that a prosecutor and an counsel is called for, and yet we cannot know the reasons. Uh, and, and I think that is a very extraordinary, and it puts us in a position where we have to try to justify what we do and go forward uh, and, and justify our investigation and know that we are exercising uh, uh, our discretion properly and our oversight. Um, I want to add the last point. You say that we should trust the Attorney General in these circumstances, and I must tell you, though I'm not happy to state it, that I do not have confidence in this Attorney General under these circumstances, and I want to explain why. In the investigation of the Vice President's telephone call, the issue was, did he violate the law? And the Attorney General conducted a, an extensive investigation and produced a report which was some 50 or 60 pages long. At the end of that report, she released the, attorney, the Vice President and said he did not violate the law. The basis for that in her report was that at the time he made the calls from the White House, which he acknowledged doing, her report concluded that, she, that he did not know he was raising political money, campaign money for the campaign. She based that on interviews conducted with him months after the fact. But I sat in this room and asked her about that, and asked her, and she pinned it down, yes, the only reason we let him off and said he didn't violate the statute is because he didn't realize at the time he was making the calls that he was, in fact, raising campaign dollars. And I pointed out to her that at his press conference, not months after he engaged in this conduct, but days after it became public, 
He said point blank, I was raising money for my campaign. And her report never even mentioned that press conference. That blows a huge hole in her report. It says his own words, before he had a chance to shape his testimony, he acknowledged point blank he was raising campaign money for his own election campaign and that of the president. And she, I asked her why her report contained that glaring error, and she had no explanation. Uh, I think we're in an extraordinary position. I agree prosecution memos typically shouldn't go public, but typically they aren't leaked. The result of that prosecution memo isn't leaked. And I would add last one last point. In most cases, prosecution memos are written to elected county attorneys, district attorneys, and attorneys general, as was the case in my office. Uh, my attorney general, the boss, my boss, was elected. And while the Prost memos were never leaked and we didn't sit in this situation, I think it was important to know that the people could hold my boss, the attorney general, accountable at the next election. The only person to whom Ms. Reno is accountable is the President of the United States, the very person who's under investigation in part in this case. And I think that puts her in a situation where the independent counsel is in fact triggered. The gentleman's time, time has time. expired. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to, uh, if I could, uh, direct the comments as has previously been stated that uh, the Attorney General in her letter wrote us back where she used the words criminal activity. And then she says at the last paragraph uh, on page one, and any target suspects and defense lawyers are watching our every move, hoping for clues that will tip them off and help them escape the law's reach. I then hear Mr. Nobel say that we are at a 1%. In other words, what we on the outside, not being on the inside, are, are at 1% of the information. Can you please, Mr. Director, Mr. Labella, or as appropriate from the panel, discuss with us how long is this going to take? What is it like when you're out there? Who are the adversaries who are there? Are there multiple trial lawyers, defense lawyers that are out there? What, what, is, what is it like? Mr. Director? I mean, there are cases that are already indicted. Uh, I agree so, with that. We're talking about the ongoing investigation. Well, we, I guess we're, we're talking about both. I mean, we, we address both. but. Um, there are, there are witnesses who have cooperated. Uh, there are people who know that they will likely be um, before a grand jury. There are people who know that they may be the subject of an investigation. I mean, those are the people, those are the people who have the, the keen interest in seeing this document see the light of day because it's going to give them a roadmap as so to what... So all these agents, they go and hire defense lawyers? No. <laughs> I think what we're talking about is anybody who's a potential subject, and the people who you've been talking about um, are not, you know, uh, Asian subjects. Right, who, who are they? The people that you have all been talking about. The well, about the President of the United States and the Vice President. Are you engaging them in the marketplace and their defense lawyers? Are we engaging them in yes. the marketplace? Um, I've done white-collar investigations for a long time. This is a very, these are very difficult cases to, to investigate for reasons. Because Does the President of the United States or the Vice President of the United States, have they engaged defense lawyers who are fighting law enforcement while attempting to gather the facts? I'm not in contact with, with um, the President and the Vice President vis-a-vis -vis their retention of counsel. I can tell you that, that counsel has appeared on behalf of virtually every witness we've subpoenaed into the, the grand jury. The, the President's counsel? I know the President has an attorney. So the president's attorney met with the president's attorney. So the president met with the vice attorney. president's attorney. Okay. So now you, what you're testifying to is that the president's counsel that of his that they are paying for is representing these people in the marketplace to where the president and the vice president of the United States are trying to fight official law enforcement country. Now, is that I'm, your testimony? No saying is the president's counsel represents the president and the vice president's counsel represents the vice president. I thought that was your question. I misunderstood No, I'm that. talking about in the marketplace. In other words, when you're going and do your investigation, the attorney general talks about defense lawyers are watching our every move. Well, who let me tell are, you. Okay. Who I, I are those I, people? Okay, I think I can answer that question. Um, the reality in, in the, the District of Columbia, as I've come to know it, is that um, there are joint defense agreements. And these joint defense agreements are 
as thick as closing binders. They're probably two, three inches thick. Um, everyone has a lawyer. Everyone does a shuffle in a white collar case. Uh, everyone forgets their name when you start to question them. Okay. Uh, everyone, when you put a memorandum in front of them, says, I see my signature, I see the memorandum, but I don't remember writing it, I don't remember what it says, and I can't tell you why I wrote it. Or the I've, been doing, I've been doing white collar cases all, virtually all my career. This the is the shuffle that you get. It's not the president or the vice president I'm talking about. Every witness that you come up against in a white collar case. These are very difficult cases to make. Do the, does the president have his counsel, his lawyers, the vice president, their lawyers, as advocates for these people who are in investigation? Not that I'm aware of. Mr. No. Not that I'm aware of. When, you, when your investigators go out, do they normally take a lawyer from the Department of Justice? No. They don't normally do that. Might they have done that uh, in the last week or so when they went to New York to talk about the, uh, the uh, cashier's checks? Or would, would it be an FBI agent, or would that have been a lawyer also? No, uh, it was an FBI agent and a, and a prosecutor. Why would that but, occur if they normally don't do that? Well, there are exceptions to any rule. You know, when I was an assistant U.S. attorney, sometimes I would go out in the field with agents to do an interview. Sometimes I wouldn't. I don't know exactly what the circumstances were here. Yeah, but it's, it's, not, it's not... Not normal. It's not the normal routine. That's correct. Good. Thank I, you. I, I should tell you, when I was a prosecutor in New York, and I, actually I guess I still am a prosecutor, over long. Um, I would often go on interviews with agents and we would often conduct them together. So uh, it's not an abnormal practice for me personally as a prosecutor. I would, I would often do it, especially key interviews. But I would often do that so I could monitor the investigation if the agents didn't mind. I appreciate all three of you being here today very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was inter intrigued by your, your reference to the public perhaps knowing one percent of what's in the, the memo. Uh, I would urge the, the public to keep that in mind and others as well as they try to speculate what Mr. Starr uh, might have in his report. It's been my experience whether we're talking about a process memo or a material presented to a grand jury by uh, independent counsel or a, uh, a U.S. attorney or an investigative team uh, that the public knows very little about what actually is going on. Uh, I think your words in that regard is a caution to uh, a lot of folks, both in the administration and out of the administration, would be well advised. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit intrigued following up on my colleague from, Arizona, uh, from uh, uh, Texas. Uh, the Attorney General writes in, in her letter on page two, the letter today at the end of the third paragraph, that criminals, targets, and defense lawyers uh, alike can all agree on one thing. They would love to have a prosecutor's plans. Uh, Talking here about, a, a, as I, I think uh, we're talking about, a, 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 well, one uses the words a core group of, of individuals, but basically we're talking about covered persons here, uh, as well as those uh, who might be engaged in criminal activity with them who are not themselves covered persons. Uh, is, is the real fear then that, uh, that the White House would get a hold of this memo uh, and, be, and be able to use it in much the same way that they have used uh, information that they have gleaned from wit other witnesses? appeared before uh, Kenneth Starr's grand jury? My fear would be that any potential witness or any potential subject or target of the investigation would get his or her hands on this report and use it to the detriment um, of, of the investigators and the investigation. And that would it's include, not just, I'm not talking about anybody in particular. That would include the president and vice president, so it would it's include important for anybody, them not to have this. It would include anybody who, who is dealt with in, in connection with this report. I'm not going to you know, uh, confirm or deny who is in, in this report. All I'm going to tell you is that we have re I have recommended um, an independent counsel be appointed, and it's my opinion, my you know, considered opinion, that this could hurt the investigators and the investigation in a hundred different ways. Because witnesses, you don't make a, a, a white-collar case by going to the target, tapping him on the shoulder and say, confess, please. You make them by inches, sometimes centimeters. You get a document. You go after a witness, you crack that witness, you go up the ladder, you crack that witness, you go up, you crack the next witness. That's how you make these cases. And those witnesses, wherever they are on, on, this, on, this, on the ladder, are important. And that could be 
prejudicial to the investigators and the investigation. I'm trying to say. But, I mean, but you think it's important that no covered person uh, be able to have access to this? I think it's important that no one who is within the range, whether they're covered, non-covered, within the range of our criminal investigation be given the access that, to this that, document. That includes, I'm not asking whose names are in there, yes, that includes include the every, president and vice president. It would include everybody who is within the parameters of this investigation, within including the parameters the, of Including of the report. president and vice president. I mean, they, they, are are, they are within the parameters of everything we've been talking about, which is the subject matter of the two reports. I'm not going to, I'm not going to comment on who in particular is a subject of a paragraph or a sentence in this report. What I'm saying is... I'm, and I'm not asking that. Right. I'm saying it's your opinion as well as mine, I think, that it's important that no person, and that includes a whole range of people, including the president and vice president, should have access to the report. And maybe that, that is a good reason why it should not be made public. Yes, I, I mean, I think that's a correct statement. Uh, given, given the fact that the, that the committee, though, has already uh, indicated both in the terms of the, of, of the subpoena as, as well as in, in all the other discussions, uh, is not interested in receiving 6E material. Uh, the only other basis, legal basis, for refusing to comply with the subpoena would be executive. Neither you, Mr. LaBella, nor you, Mr. Free, is recommending that the Attorney General uh, refuse to comply with this subpoena, are you? No, I've certainly not recommended that. Mr. LaBella? No, my, my you're simply ur urging us that there are some very sound reasons other than the legally applicable one of, of yes. uh, simply speaking, executive privilege. That's right. That should cause us not to press the issue. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think I think early early in your testimony, uh, Free, you said that this was in in essence, and I'm, I wasn't sure whether you were referring to your memo or Bella's memo, or both of them prosecution memos. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use that term to apply to both of them? Yes, I would apply it to both of them. Uh, are, are they really, strictly speaking, prosecution memos in the sense that I, as a former U.S. attorney, might be familiar with the, the, the layout of a Hobbs Act prosecution with all the names of the different witnesses and, all, and truly all of the theories of the case down to who's going to be called when and where? Uh, or, or are these somewhat more general documents? I mean, the, the, the length of them, I think, uh, about, belies the fact that it's a full-fledged pros memo. Speaking for, for my memo, it, it's not a pros memo as you from your strike force or from your uh, section chiefs when you were U.S. attorney. It doesn't lay out in detail witnesses, proof, objections to that. It's not uh, in those details at all. It's in a much more generic term. But it does discuss by statute, by elements of a particular statute, theories of prosecution and the evidence that supports that. Is there, if I could, just one very quick uh, question. Is, is there not then some way uh, we've already and we all agree that there should not be 16 material in there. Is there not some way that some of the essence of what we're trying to get at here could be conveyed to us yes, uh, there is. without that? Yes, there is. There's a very good way. And with, us. with all due respect, we did this um, last year in agreement with the chairman and, and the Mr. Waxman and the attorney general, as I understand her letter, and having discussed it with her, she's offering a very uh, extraordinary uh, presentation from my point of view, which is a briefing to the committee on the document once she's had the opportunity to, to make to, a decision. To the, to the I think that's a, 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 a just a very good opportunity for everybody to compromise on an issue that avoids a constitutional confrontation. Do you have no problem over Mr. LaBella in presenting that in an in appropriate setting to the full committee? Well, uh, uh, we would certainly uh, pursue what we did which was to the chairman and the vice chairman, and I would be willing to discuss certainly expanding it beyond that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't commit to that today? I wouldn't commit to it at this point. I, I think the attorney general will have to be consulted. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. I'm the last Mr. question. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, two votes on the House floor with five minutes left, and I want to hear your questioning. And Mr. Barrett wanted to pursue his uh, five-minute round, which he has not been able to pursue. May, may I request that we break? and then come back in 10 minutes? Well, the only reason I, I was going to go ahead and, and literally miss this vote myself to conclude was because we've kept these gentlemen here all day, and if we go down there, there's going to be a half hour before we get back. Well, not really, if because Mr. there's only two votes. If Mr. Barrett wants to stay and question, uh, that's fine with me, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm going to stick with this and, and try to adjourn. He may meeting. well come back, but I, I do want to hear your questioning. But well, you're welcome to stay, too. <laughs> yeah, but I do have an obligation to vote on the House. Well, so floor. do I, but I think this is more important, and these gentlemen's time has been 
changed upon enough, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead with my five minutes at this point. Uh, first of all, let me just say uh, I appreciate very much your being here. Uh, the, the arguments that have been made continually by all of you is that we should not uh, insist on seeing these documents. Uh, I not only care if they redact 6C material, any other material in there that it would bear on the investigation and, imp and, and, and impede the investigation, maybe we could work that out as well. But we want to know the basic reasons why you and Mr. LaBella and Mr. DeSarno should be an independent counsel. There's been no offer whatsoever other than you'll get together with me and the minority uh, ranking minority member to discuss this. And that's not going to be sufficient. We have a lot of members who want to be informed about this because it's been leaked to the papers. The other thing is, if it's been leaked to the papers uh, uh, by people who obviously uh, have had copies of this, then, uh, uh, you know, I don't think there's any more danger being leaked to the papers by this committee than it has been from the Justice Department. Nevertheless, uh, you know, I'm willing to, uh, to listen to some reasonable requests on how we can make sure everybody on the committee understands the reasons why you and Mr. LaBella want an independent counsel, uh, short of giving us 6C material or other material that uh, might endanger the, uh, the investigation. Now, let me just ask you one more question, all three of you. Are you familiar with the August 14, 1992 memo from Melinda Yee to then Governor Bill Clinton? I want to read the text of the memo. Maybe that will refresh your memory. This is from Melinda Yee regarding a car ride with James Riotti. It's October, or August 14, 1992. James Riotti is the deputy chairman of the Lippo Group and a longtime acquaintance of yours. The group is in financial services in the U.S. and throughout the world. Mr. Riotti lived in Arkansas from 85 to 87 when he was president of the Worthen Bank in Little Rock. He has flown all the way from Indonesia, where he is now based, to attend the fundraiser. He will be giving $100,000 to this event and has the potential to give much more. He will talk to you about banking issues and international business. This is primarily a courtesy call. Soon after the receipt of that memo, the Riottis contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to the DNC and other Democrat causes, even though it appears Mr. Riotti was not uh, living in the country. Are you looking into these contributions in 1992? I, I believe we're, we're looking at all those allegations. Um, I can, I can double check when I get back to the task force today. But I believe we're looking into all those allegations. Well, I, I'm not. I, I don't believe this is an allegation. We've got a copy of the memo from Melinda Yee, and we've got the money that was given to them from the right. Riotis. I believe we're following all those leads, and I believe we've seen that document. But I can't tell you. I, I don't look at every document in every investigation. I'll have to check with the lawyers that are handling that. It doesn't raise uh, some questions or issues regarding the relationship between the president and James Riotti. Uh, you're uh, aware that Mr. Riotti has refused to cooperate. Investigation. We're certainly aware of, of all the facts and circumstances surrounding uh, Mr. Riyadh's relationship, such as it is with uh, the White House and the President. And the President. Yeah. Okay, let me just ask one more question and then we'll uh, let you guys call it a day. Okay, excuse me. Uh, much of the sought by this committee during the course of its investigation is held overseas and is therefore obtainable only through the assistance of foreign governments. Of particular interest to us are the bank records held by the Bank of China, Hong Kong, the Bank of China, Macau, the Bank of Central Asia, Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, this is for all of you. Is it, it's my understanding that the DOJ Campaign Finance Task Force is seeking to obtain similar information from foreign sources. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, yes. that's correct. You are seeking to find that information. Absolutely. It's our understanding that you had little success in obtaining access to foreign records to date. Is that correct? Those efforts are ongoing. I think we've had some success. I can't, uh, you know, and, and I think we really, we expect, we expect some success in the next week or two with respect to one country. We have, we have expectations that we're going to get records within the next several weeks. But from, you haven't had substantial success, but you're having some. We're having some. Okay. I would note that this is the same situation that we've been faced with in addition to the over 100, 110 people who have fled the country or taken the fifth. Has the response of foreign governments to date been satisfactory as far as you're concerned? 
has the response from? It really depends on which country we're talking about. Every country has been different. How about China? Uh, to my we haven't received anything from China. How about uh, Indonesia? I think, I think we're, uh, we may be on the verge of getting something uh, from Indonesia. How about Taiwan? I'm not aware of anything we received from Taiwan. We may have. I'm not aware of it. Macau. I'm not aware of anything from Macau. How about, uh, how about uh, Egypt? I am not sure about Egypt. We have to, you know, I have to double check on all these countries can, can, with can respect to the... Can you give us the, an accounting? Would you give us a, a We can certainly do that. that. Which countries that you've, you've uh, identified we have got... Well, We'll from. give you a list of the countries. There's others Good. that we've identified in Latin America and so forth. Okay. With regard to the Bank of China records and the Chinese government specifically, are you aware of any cooperation in providing bank records from Hong Kong or China? I think you said that you haven't had any cooperation no. from them. And I'm not aware of any documents okay. we've received from them, no. In fact, no records from the Bank of China have been turned over to any investigators so far that you know of. Other than the ones Bank of China in the United States has turned over documents. Yeah, that we have about that, right. but as far as uh, offshore. Okay. Now, well, let me ask you what's... <laughs> well, you know, there may, there may be documents that we received uh, from the Bank of China in the United States that were actually foreign documents because they had them on their computer. They may have given them to us. So uh, technically we did get some foreign documents, but we got them from the New York from the um, onshore. branch. Now, last fall when President Jiang came to Washington, D.C., he claimed he was going to cooperate with a campaign finance investigation. Has the Chinese government cooperated in any way that you're aware of? Not to my knowledge. In fact, the Chinese government hasn't even allowed your investigators to get visas, have they? I, I don't know that we've requested visas. I don't know that we've done that, but uh, we've, we've, they may know Mr. that. Mr. can answer Did that. you try to get visas? <clears throat> yes, it, at one point we did. I, we have not uh, in recent times tried to, tried to did get Did they any. deny you getting the visas? Uh, we got denied at one point, but uh, we have not tried it recently. You have not, but when you asked for visas, you didn't get them. My investigators didn't get them either. We asked, for, they were denied out of hand. We asked the President of the United States to take our people along with 1,200 others to China, and uh, we didn't get a response. According to news reports, during President Clinton's trip to China, President Zhang claimed the Chinese government had conducted an inquiry into the allegations of illegal foreign money from Chinese sources, and he said, we conducted a very earnest investigation into the matter, and the result of the investigation shows that there never was never such a thing. Do you believe that statement by him? I'd like to see his report. <laughs> Do you believe that statement by him? Not without re reviewing the report. How about you, Mr. LaBella? Um, I really don't, I mean, I, I can't comment on the accuracy of his statement. I mean, it really wouldn't be appropriate. Well, the President of the United States said he believed it. The president said categorically he believed President Jiang when he was over there in a news conference. Well, with all due respect to the president, he doesn't have Rule 6E uh, materials available to him, and he doesn't have um, documents and evidence that I do. And for me to comment on that, I would, one way or another, be commenting on things before the grand, uh, before the grand jury and before the task force. Well, we know that the money came in $300,000 from the head of the aerospace industry through Johnny Chen. And, and, and uh, other monies came in from China. He says he knew of no organized effort. This lady, uh, what was her name, Miss Lu Chao Ying, uh, she uh, was part of the hierarchy in the uh, in the Chinese government, in the military. Her father was one of the leaders in the military over there. So it's inconceivable that he would be part of their so-called Politburo. He, and his daughter was giving three hundred thousand dollars to Johnny Chung, and the head of the Chinese government didn't know about it. Don't you think that's interesting? There are a lot of things that I've found interesting about the task force's but work, comment. but I can't comment on, on All right. whether I believe it is true I, or not. I understand. Now, I understand you can't comment about classified intelligence information, but to the extent that certain information is to light through the Senate investigation in public reports, and to the extent that you can comment publicly, is this consistent with what you've been le learning leads the FBI uh, is following? Talking about Jiang's statement, I think you've commented on that. On the same trip to China, President Clinton said in response to Jiang's comments, Jiang said they looked into that and he was obviously certain, and I do believe him, has not ordered or authorized or approved such a thing, and they could find no evidence that anybody with governmental authority had done that. And uh, I guess this is redundant, but do you believe that statement? I'd like to see the report. All right. <laughs> 
we, we, we can't support there. Are, are, aren't, uh, aren't your people continuing to investigate foreign links and not accepting Jang's uh, denials? Yes, sir. And Mr. LaBella, is it still an as uh, active aspect of your investigation? We're following all the leads that we have, wherever <laughs> they take us, overseas or in the United States. Okay. Mr. Free, we have been briefed publicly about intelligence information relating to the campaign finance investigation. You've participated in some of these briefings. Has the FBI or Justice Department felt obliged to share any of the same, in same information with the White House through the National Security Council? Uh, some of it has been shared, some of it has not been. And as I think I mentioned in December when I testified, the Attorney General and I have a process by which we make those determinations, and it's a case-by-case -case review. It's fact-specific, but there are instances where uh, information has not uh, gone to the NSC, which uh, uh, we've decided for uh, balancing purposes uh, is not appropriate. So, to so go you and the Attorney General jointly make these decisions? Yes, sir. We have been. Do you know how many times intelligence information relating to the campaign finance in investigation has been shared with the White House? No, not in terms of times, but there are regular intervals where we present information. So you present information to the White House regarding the campaign finance investigation? No, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't categorize it as that. I would say that from time to time, based on uh, a review, and it's a review which includes Mr. LaBella, not just myself and the Attorney General, uh, national security information, which uh, does not conflict with the integrity of the uh, criminal investigation is presented to the uh, the White House and the national security policy makers as I think it should be but I think there needs to be a careful uh, evaluative and weighing process who else is involved in that decision making process uh, the attorney general her assistants and deputies her assistants are any of her assistants that are involved in this process political appointees well I like know mr. lit I know mr. holder gets involved in those from time to time Does mr. lit I don't know for a fact that he is. I don't know who the Attorney General consults. Mr. Holder is a political appointee. Who's the other guy? Does Radic? I don't know for a fact that he gets involved in those. When was the last time the FBI or Justice Department briefed the White House on these matters? Uh, I don't know. I can find out for you. Could you find that yes. out for us? Did any of this information briefed to the White House factor into your conclusion that General Reno should appoint an independent counsel? No. Mr. LaBella, I'd like to pose the same question to you. Uh, did any of the intelligence information briefed to the White House factor into your conclusion that Reno, Janet Reno should uh, appoint an independent counsel? No. Mr. Free, wouldn't you agree that the FBI's ongoing obligations to brief the White House on sensitive intelligent matters conflicts seriously with its responsibilities for handling the criminal side of this investigation? No, I wouldn't agree with that. I think what I would agree with is that the development of national security information in the context of the criminal investigation, which has clearly occurred, requires a very careful and very delicate balancing and review by and the Attorney General, and that there are occasions when information uh, we both agree should pass. There have been instances, not many, but instances where we agree that it should not pass. I think in the report you raised some concerns about that, did you not, though? Yes, sir. Uh, wouldn't the appointment of an independent counsel going a long way towards resolving that conflict? It would change that. Uh, in other words, if um, hypothetically there was an independent counsel and the independent counsel developed national security information, which was also directly relevant to his or her criminal inquiry, I think he or she would have to probably go to the Attorney General with that national security information and the Attorney General would have to make a decision. The latter decision would be different, however, because the Attorney General would not be supervising the underlying criminal investigation. Okay, finally, uh, I was talking about traveler's checks earlier. Uh, the traveler's checks that we talked about, the $200,000 that came from Florida, these same traveler's checks also show that former Deputy Finance Director at the DNC, David Mercer, deposited 5,000 of these traveler's checks in the White House Credit Union. We don't yet have an explanation from Mr. Mercer, but we have submitted inquiries to him. But isn't this the kind of situation with a DNC finance official where uh, there are uh, potential conflicts or appearance of conflicts with the Attorney General from the Democrat Party? 
that, that's a decision that the Attorney General has to make whether or not the, the, the fact of Mr. Mercer presents a, con a potential conflict for her. That's not something that I, I've ever opined on. Well, I think the statute talk about officials at the Democrat National Committee. It t no, it talks about, it talks the about campaign covered officials. It, it talks about campaign officers, both by name and general category. Well, Mr. Mercer, like I said, who was the deputy finance director, 5,000 of these illegal uh, checks coming in from uh, Jakarta. And, uh, well, there were, yeah. He's a, he's a DNC official, as I understand, not a uh, Clinton Gore 96 official. Don't you think the American people have more confidence in an independent investigation of uh, this whole matter? I, I can't speak for the American people. I don't know how. You know they review or understand even all the intricacies of, of what's going on. I think the fact that there is disagreement about how the facts and law apply here is certainly uh, indicative of, a, of an important issue that needs to be resolved. Well, I, I want to end up thanking all three of you. It's been a long day. I, I appreciate your patience and I appreciate your recommendations to the Attorney General. I only hope that she uh, sees to yeah. accept them. Mr. Chairman, can I make one closing remark just yes, very you briefly? Sure can. First of all, let me thank you and the committee for your uh, uh, just uh, taking up these issues, which are very important. And as you know, I have, uh, I have tremendous respect for you and for the committee and uh, for your fine counsel, minority counsel. Uh, I really, one more time, would uh, very, very respectfully ask you to uh, consider uh, the timing of when uh, this appeal under consideration would need to be. Uh, enforce and uh, again I do that with with great uh, respect and great deference you have excellent counsel uh, there the minority has good counsel I think you and I have the relationship and our staffs have the relationship that uh, we can work out as far as I well, can I see some if we can avoid a constitutional confrontation I think it's in everybody's interest particularly if we're talking about a, a three or four week period I, I, of time. I think that uh, that is in the in the ballpark of the Attorney General if she wants to make a recommendation to us that will give us the guts of what we want without endangering uh, the investigation or grand jury and 60 material we'll take a look at it We're not interested in any way in impeding the investigation I want to state that very clearly but we want to know very clearly why all three of you believe there should be an independent counsel and right now we don't know and we think the American a right to know that. So if it can be worked out, fine. It's going to have to happen pretty quick. And with that, thanks for being here. The meeting stands adjourned.
And this program note will be re-airing this hearing of the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee tonight here on C-SPAN 2, scheduled for 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Now we'll take you to a news conference that ended just a few minutes ago, started about a half hour ago with Attorney General Janet Reno and Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder. They held a briefing to discuss the issues that were raised earlier today at that House Government Reform and Oversight Committee hearing on the